Good morning, folks. Good morning. I'm using my Bose headset, so I'm not sure if the audio is good or not. If you guys can give me a heads up, let me know. If it's not, I'll disconnect it and I'll just hold the phone next to me while I'm talking. So I'll be looking for a reply from you. If the volume's good, if the audio is good, just give me a five by five. If it sucks and you want me to talk what I normally do with it, just let me know that, please. Appreciate it. Give you a minute or two to let me know. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. All right, so we're talking today on uh, Saturday morning, typical ICT shotgun Saturday. I'm not in a vehicle today. I'm sitting here in my trading office staring at my monitors that are off, reflecting on the fact that I chose to sleep in and not be a part of the morning session yesterday. And uh, my ambitious young one took it upon himself to try to do things that he wasn't prepared to do. And drive it until the brakes fall off. I wanted to impress Dad yesterday, and the other, the other side of the coin showed itself, and couldn't fix himself. So, I spent a little bit of time in the afternoon coaching him, and I spent some time with my older students in the PM session, and kind of like wanted to show what was difficult about yesterday and obviously waking up later in the morning I didn't see too much of uh, high probability of anything you know, in the morning session it was more or less seek and destroy higher highs lower lows higher highs lower lows back and forth and then finally during the lunch hour you know, kept pressing higher going into that uh, new week opening gap and then finally closing on the high at that gap so I want to kind of talk a little bit about what it was like when I was younger and also what my son experienced. And in case you don't know, um, my son has a funded account challenge or what's it called? Uh, a combine that he, he wanted to go that route. And that's fine. You know, whatever. Never traded before. And he... Is one of those individuals that like, and I mentioned it a lot of times where you, you show somebody something and even before you're done showing it, that you haven't even got through the entire presentation or illustration or example of it. They want to take it and try to do it too, right away. That, that's, that's my son. He's 100 mile an hour. He's always been that way. He was real quick to get up and walk was as a baby. And once he started moving, he doesn't stop. He's just, all right, he's going. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, but I felt that was a little bit overbearing, I, I wanted to have him set up the account where he didn't have access to it without me sitting there. But he's 18, and I felt that was a little out of place. And maybe I'm, you know, trying to be, you know, protect too much, but this is what I didn't want to see happen, at least to this degree. It's not terrible. Don't get me wrong, because you know the account that he tried to work with was a hundred. It's the hundred and fifty thousand dollar funded account combine. So that's it's, you're not getting one hundred fifty thousand. Let's be real. But he was able to see one hundred and fifty three thousand four hundred something. I think that's what he said the high was yesterday, and he didn't feel that that was enough. And he wanted to impress me and try to get it over 155. Well, <laughs> you know what that means. You probably experienced this as well. And when I was younger, uh, whenever I was doing incrementally good, not that I was trading great because I was new, but the times that I would get in, be profitable, and then not hold the trade because I was either nervous or I second guessed myself. Um, I would close the trade early and then it would run in my favor. And if I just would have held on to it, it would have hit my target and that would have been much more satisfying. But because it didn't happen that way, 
And it's just a typical thing for someone that's new. So if you experience this, or even someone that's never been consistently profitable, whenever you get a win, whether it be small or sizable, uh, you don't really feel good about it because what's happening is is new to you. You don't know where it's going. So you feel like you got to close the trade prematurely because you're afraid it's going to become a losing trade. And you really don't know where it's going to go, which is the reason why I teach all of you to learn to draw, draw on liquidity. Where is it likely to go? If you don't have that, you know, you're going to be a victim to your own emotions and you'll psych yourself out. So yesterday morning, he got lucky on his first move. Actually made 831 on a short. Got out actually at a pretty decent location. Before it reversed, and went higher. Now, if he was following the rules, that would have been it. That would have been it, and I wouldn't have been upset had he shown me just that. Because the, the rules were, like, I have to be there. Like, I got to be there next to you. I want to observe what you're doing. No, 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 that wasn't happening. <laughs> he, wanted to, he wanted to get in there and drive it. Well, he did. Went from 153.4, which was $3,400, towards the $9,000 you have to get to before you get funded. I guess that's what they call it. You pass the first phase combine. He dropped down to 149000 and some change. Now, that's nothing. Literally, I, mean, I could sit there with him this week and tell him, look, go here, do this, do that, do this. And he'll push the button. And we can get right back up to that pre-Friday morning issue. It was very difficult for me not to go off the rails and, and like be more of a dad than ICT the coach. Like I wanted to tell him, look, you know, that was not something you do. And it could have been the entirety. Like it could have been well I guess it couldn't have been really now I think about it they have like a limit and they stop you so whatever that limit that threshold is it keeps you I guess from doing more damage to whatever but uh, he didn't want to say anything to me and that was the first tip off <laughs> so so when I got up and I walked out and I saw him he broke eye contact with me and grabbed all this you know his phone and stuff and started moving around I'm like hmm He's not wanting to say anything to me. Eh, he, he was giving me a chance to you know, get my bearings. I just woke up. No, 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 no. <laughs> a couple minutes later, he's still not. He's still not saying anything. So I know right away. Okay, what's going on? Is it the girlfriend? And no, it's not the girlfriend. Um, are we doing anything today? And I, I think he was hoping it was going to be the answer. No, that would guess buy him some time over the weekend. <laughs> no. No, we're, yeah, yeah, we're going to look at the afternoon session. Let's, you know, let's go take a look at it. He goes, well, I, I want to I wanna talk to you about something, Dad. And I was like, oh, yeah, what's that? He goes, oh, I, I, I did good on the first move this morning. And I was like, you did good what? Like paper? Like you're watching tape reading? He goes, no, I actually did. You know, it was 831. 831? Oh, wow. So I'm, I'm thinking, man. All right, even though I wasn't there, I'm a, I'm a little ir irritated by that. But then he goes, but uh, I broke some rules. Rules, plural. So right away, I'm thinking, okay, you lost the 830. Okay, big deal. You know, I, I'm preparing myself for that. No, he just says, uh, you got to take a look at it to see it. I was like, okay. So I saw it, and I was like, okay, you got you to gotta recognize this is the improper way of doing it. Number one, you're, you're driving without someone next to you. Like you're, you don't, you're under your provisions still, okay, as a trader. You don't know what you're doing. And I appreciate your enthusiasm. I appreciate your excitement to try to do something. But this isn't a video game. And you don't really know what you're doing yet, which is the reason why I'm sitting next to you explaining to you what it is that you should be seeing. And I'm evaluating when you want to do something, when you think it's about to be there in terms of a setup, 
That's why you're talking to me, telling me what you think you see, because then I will tell you, that's not that. Wait for the next one. That's the whole purpose of me being next to you. I'm filtering what you think you're seeing. So I'm allowing for you to see it, observe it, but I'm also canceling out the ones that aren't not good. That's the reason why you were having 100% strike rate. That's the reason why you were going in, getting that move, and it's done, and it had next to no drawdown. You got lucky in the morning, and you had what would have been the largest win since you opened it up last Friday. You should have stopped right then and there and didn't do anything else. Why did you go back in? Now, listen to the reasons, okay? I thought that it was going to keep moving and have a big range day on the daily chart. He saw relative equal lows, and he wanted to see it go down to take that out, and he kept trying to do that. Not understanding that we had already traded down into a new week opening gap for the week. It had multiple attempts to go lower and was failing to do that. It was the chart basically I shared on Twitter. And I, that the range that it would return back into would be that down move. It's going to trade up into what? Buy side liquidity or premium inefficiencies. So he kept trying and kept trying and kept trying. And he said he had one or two times where he tried to go long, but he was afraid to hold the long because he felt that those relative equal lows was going to be the one that they take out. So he kept pushing, 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 and small little incremental slices took away the 831 and then took away the week of gains and progress that we were able to put onto it. And now he sits at 149. So I told him, I said, well, first and foremost, number one, the rule is this. You do not do this without me next to you. And he's like, I, I'm, I, that's not going to happen anymore. I know now I'm not ready. And it, it makes me angry because I thought I could see it. And I was like, you're not going to learn it that quick. Like, this is exactly what all of you listening to me here in this Twitter space tend to do as well. You're just like that impatient person. Like when you're trying to show somebody, I'm like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a novice magician since I was a child. Okay? I, I, I've always enjoyed it, do card tricks and you know, coin tricks and all that kind of stuff. And invariably, I would always show somebody something. And that's that, there's just one guy in the crowd always that wants to pretend or show that they know how it was done. And they try to do it, and of course they fall on their face and look stupid. And then because they can't do it, then they attack you and say, well, it's really not any trick to it. It's, you know, it's, it's this or that, whatever. That's a weak-minded person, okay? And everybody comes into trading as a weak-minded person. You're impatient. You want to rush to making money. You want to rush to do something right because you want to feel smart. You want to feel good about yourself. And my son is very results-driven. Like he wants, he wants to get accolades early. Uh, he, he does well in the sports. He does well in his video games. He's, he's done one well academically. He just always wants to do better than everyone else. And that's kind of like you know, ingrained in the DNA from me. Of all my children, he's that. He's that one. And I tried to explain to him. I said, listen, this is an industry. This is a thing, okay, that you can't do that in. As much as you're going to be feeling inside that you're going to be able to do that with this, you won't. Believe me, it's hard for me to tell you that because you're my son, but I'm also telling you because, number one, I thought I was going to be the exception, and I wasn't the exception. And it's very difficult to accept that when it first happens, and you just had it slammed upside your forehead. Right now, you are at that point where most traders that are coming up either go completely into tilt where they just turn into a gambler and they don't look at this as they did it, they undid themselves, it isn't a system failure, it means that that was recklessness. And you need to understand that that was recklessness. 
You can't do these things and expect it to come out with good outcomes. So to be honest with you, I don't even know how to pull up, you know, the trades. And so if you guys are aware of how to do that, like, I don't know, like, I don't know how to go back and look at, like, if we do a trade in paper trading on TradingView or your live trades, you can see the little executions and it tells you where I don't know how to do that with the funded accounts. So if you can help me with that, I would love to be able to go back and see what he did. But I don't have that in front of me. I just know that this is the aftermath and this is what he's done. So I, I got to obviously help him next week to, to recoup that. But the, uh, the mental aspects of having done so, you know, he's, he's feeling that. A little bit of embarrassment, a little bit of, you know, his pride being bruised. And as much as it is not fun to see him go through it, you know, I see some of you come out and say, you know, I did this to myself and I knew what I was doing was wrong, but I still did it and I feel like crap. And I always try to tell you, look, chin up. You know, you just, this is normal. Everybody goes through it. It's true still with my son, but it's different because it's my son. <laughs> so it's a little weird. You know, I, I kind of anticipated this coming because I'm pushing him in to settings where that's going to happen. But I was hoping it would happen right where I was sitting next to him and his overzealous nature, you know, he just did it and I wasn't there. So, which is fine. You know, I mean, he's, he's 18. He's, it's, you know, it's, it's his prerogative. He can do that. But I told him, I said, listen, if, if you want to learn how to do this, you have to submit to this process that this is the way I'm going to do it with you. Otherwise, I'm going to leave you to learning it from the videos alone. Now, I'm not really wanting you to go through it that way. It's not going to be the same as if me sitting next to you and I'm going to filter it and explain it to you. You'll be able to have that advantage that I'm not making available to everybody else because I'm not obligated to all of you. But I feel obligated to him because he's my, my son. He's my offspring. And I want him to, to be equipped, to be just like and better than me. So he's had that first experience of undoing himself. He feels the shame. He feels the remorse, the regrets. And I want him to understand that that's normal. So you're going to have times when you're, gonna, you're just going to do it. You're going to do that. You're going to feel confident about yourself. You're going to be overconfident. You're going to have a losing trade or you'll have that experience where you made money. It felt great. You want to do it again because you feel like it's going to move even more. And then you try to go back in again and it's not doing what you want it to do. And then now you got to go into fixing. You're starting to put it, you know, put fires out that you started yourself. But you don't realize it's not water that you're pouring on the fire. <laughs> you're pouring gasoline on it. And it, it accelerates. And that wildfire spreads. And it eats into not only the gain that you were unsatisfied with, but now it starts eating into equity that you worked hard for to build up. And then entering to drawdown. And that, that threshold, it's okay to lose what you made on a trading day. It's easy to tolerate that. It's just frustration. Yeah, it sucks a little bit. But then when you eat up what you worked for for a week or a month or so, that really hurts. That's like a kick in the joint. You don't really like that. It sucks. And especially if you go into a weekend as a trader, that really, really stings. And it takes the pleasure out of everything. Food don't taste as well. Friends, company, it irritates the shit out of you. You know, everything is heightened and it feels like thorns, no comfort, no rest. And you punish yourself. He's feeling that. But when you get into drawdown where you go beyond where you started and you did it to yourself and you just recklessly plunge in there trying to get it back quickly, quickly, quickly. And you just keep doing more damage. I think that's actually a good thing that 
the funded account companies have that threshold where they stop you. It's like you can't do anymore. That's it. You've, you've done enough. And it makes you have to take a step back and reevaluate what you're doing. Now, he doesn't know why it didn't work. He just thought he saw the things that he's supposed to be looking for. What did he have wrong? Apart from going back in when he had an, a, a really respectful return, $831, that's a, that's a nice little return. That's actually above the, the range of target that I had set forth for him saying, look, this is all you're trying to do. You're trying to do this, nothing else. You're not trying to get rich. You're not trying to blow it up. You're not trying to pass the combine in a week. You're not trying to pass it in five days. Okay. We set the pace for two weeks, two weeks. That means next Friday, his target should have been reaching the, I guess it would be part two or phase two of it. And he was well on track with that. Now, I got to go in and help him get back to that square one. And you might think, oh, well, you know, you shouldn't do that. Well, you know, it's my son. Don't, don't tell me what the fuck to do, okay? But I'm sharing something with you that it's not, I'm not obligated to share. But I want you to understand just because he's my son, you know, there isn't some kind of carryover because he has my DNA in him. He has every character flaw that a male has. Pride arrogance, impatience. He wants to flex. That's in him. He's rushing to be able to flex. And now he's wrestling with that now. He's like, I, I, I blew it. And now I feel bad because we worked several days and then now I got to go back and do that all over again. More specifically, I got to hear you tell me that it was my fault when I already keep telling myself inside my head, it's my fault. Well, that's all part of it. You have to feel that pain. It has to be a consequence, a formidable consequence, something that is, you know, it's going to shake you up and make you feel like you don't ever want to risk doing that again because this is what you feel. This is what it's like. And all that work that you went through the first time where it felt effortless, it felt fun, it was it's, it's an experience that was enjoyable, now you're in under where they start you at because they give you at 150. Now you're at 149, a little bit over 149. So now you have to get back to that starting point. And everything you do now, every trade, you're going to be concerned much more so about the outcome because you're in drawdown. And that creates toxic thinking. And you tend to do what? You tend to avoid following the rules, you, you basically abandon everything that you're supposed to be doing, which is the reason why people fail themselves and they blow their account. Because now you've increased the sensitivity to every transaction you make until you get back to your equity high. Like that's the magic thing. Like that's the magic number. You have to have that money back in your account or you're going to be scared all the time. And in your mind, you're thinking, and everybody does this. Okay, this is what it felt like for me when I first blew my first account or approaching, going back in through correcting drawdown. Everybody that goes through drawdown, everyone, I don't give a fuck how long you've been trading, how much money you make. When you go through drawdown and you have an equity high, and you've drawn down from that equity high, you feel like you're staring up at a mountain. And it may not even be that much money. And this is not a lot of money. I could literally do his entire funded account shit on Monday. I could get him at, at 159 rate. I can do $10,000 on Monday. I can do that. Th that's not what this is about. I'm teaching him. But now this lesson came a whole lot sooner <laughs> and not in the way I wanted it to happen. I wanted him to do those things in front of me where I can control how much the drawdown was and then teach him right then and there. Okay. Now this is what you're going to do to mitigate it. You're going to stop right here today. Leave it alone. Go home with the loss. And then we'll come back tomorrow, trade with half the size and then build it back up. And then you'll be fine. You'll, you won't be afraid of it. So now he has that toxic feeling of impatience 
I got to get it back. And I'm sure he feels it even worse than you would because ICT is his dad. He knows I'm going to be in his ass about it. Not yet because I don't want to add to what he's already feeling. But once we get it back up, I'm going to get into his ass. <laughs> okay? But he needs to be on good footing before I do that because I don't want to crush his spirit. Once he has the account back up, then I can you know, chew into his ass and tell him, look, this is what you did wrong. This is how you've now impacted your perspective on price. You don't realize it yet, but you're going to remember this every single time you get into a trade and it starts drawing against you, even a little bit. It's just the beginning of that same thing I just did to myself in the beginning. Three years from now, you're going to think that same thing. And there's two perspectives to have in mind. You can look at that and then cause it and allow it to cause paralysis and second guess yourself. Or you can say, yep, that's the reason why I'm using a stop loss. Yep, that's the reason why I'm not over leveraging. Yep, that's the reason why I'm going to take a loss in the session and stop and come back the next session. If I'm not all going to trade anymore today, I have to wait and come back in the next session. You place time between your transactions. Because if you're trading when you take a loss and you go right back in, unless you have a lot of experience, it's better for you to take a step away, put time between that, because you have, chem you have chemicals coursing through your bloodstream that are really having an impact on how you see things. See, in your mind, you see that loss or that drawdown as an emergency, just like he felt on Friday morning. He felt that that was an emergency. He could lose that entire thing and have to reset it. I would not be ashamed of that because that's normal. He doesn't know what he's doing. Left to his own devices and his own intellect, he would absolutely 100%, 1,000% likelihood he's going to fail that if I'm not next to him. And that was the reason why I told him, I said, make these decisions when I'm next to you and let me filter them for you, okay? You'll learn still by doing it. But let me at least be there to filter it. And Friday morning, he wanted to be, you know, 18 and life to go mentality. He's going to go out there and be a murderer and, and kill it. And bottom line is he wasn't ready. And he found out by shock and awe that he was absolutely not ready. And if they didn't have that threshold of stopping him, he probably would have done more damage. Because listening to him, I didn't get any kind of indication that he had any breaks. So he was pushing and pushing until the breaks came off. That's an, he wasn't going to stop until he was done, one way or the other. And that's exactly how all of you, and that's exactly how I was, as a 20-year-old, when I was blowing accounts, that's exactly what it was like in my head. I'm going to push this bitch until the brakes come off. Nothing's stopping me. No one could have told me, stop what you're doing. It, it, you, you're, you're, you're being careless, reckless. You're gambling. You're trying to do something that's impossible to do right now. Your, your clarity is escaping you. You, you don't have it. You're, you're literally just pushing the button hoping something happens with no reason for having any reason to be in the trade. You just want to do something. You feel like you got to do something. Why? Why do you feel like that? Because you have adrenaline coursing through your body and you scared the shit out of yourself and cortisol. Those two chemicals in your body is telling you what? The same thing your brain is telling you. You've now, now you've made it a emergency. You're lying to yourself by saying, I should be panicking right now, when you shouldn't be. The opposite. As soon as you start feeling emotional about it, like you have to take the trade, you've got to get in there. That is the clearest indication to turn them fucking charts off. Leave your house, go for a drive with your phone not in your hand, and spend at least 30 minutes away. you got to let those chemicals – and imbalances burn off because you're literally under the influence of high stress chemicals that our bodies produce to enable us to fight or run away 
It's fight or flight. And you're sitting here in front of these, car- these charts telling yourself that there's an emergency that you've created. And there's a fire that you got to put out. You know how you put it out? It's real easy. Close all positions, remove all orders, turn the charts off, and get the fuck away from it. There it is. It's handled. No more emergency. That's it. You have a paper cut. Yes, your pride's hurt. Yes, you did damage to the account, but you have an account still. If you blow the account, yeah, you burned your house down. (laughs) It sucks. But all of that still is not an emergency. You can refund. You can reset. You can add more money to an account, all that. But see, what happens is when you draw down from an equity high, especially when you're new, and then you fall from that height, and $3,400 is shit money. Like, that's nothing. It's not even real money. It's, the, it's the, the combine. But in his mind, he's thinking, like, that's a lot of money to him. And he wants to get funded. He wants to. And here's the reason why he's wanting to rush, too. They have senior week coming up in June where all the kids here, they all go down to Eastern Shore and rent hotel rooms. And they all act like fools and carry on. And he wants to have a lot of money to just do whatever and be a baller in front of his girlfriend. And that was what was in his mind Friday morning. He wanted to be out there, you know, throwing dollar bills around, you know, like a madman. And looking, you know, padded out because he knows I'm not going to throw money in like that because I know I know he's going down there to be foolish. So I tell him, save all his money that he's earning at his coffee shop job. And then he spends that. So, of course, you know, being a young man, he wants to have more than that. <clears throat> so when you have these equity highs that you slip away from and you have drawdown, it literally feels like you're walking up to a mountain and you're looking up, getting a kink in your neck as you look up at the height. And you tell yourself, I got to get all the way back up there. When before, when you were building it up, you didn't look at that like that. You were just trying to take one trade at a time. It was just one step at a time, like a rock climber. Where's my next foothold? Where's my next gripping point? That's all you cared about. You're doing the right thing. That's following the model. Now what's happening is, is when you are in drawdown, you're looking up at that mountain, that peak that you slid down from. And you're thinking, how am I going to get back up there? Well, fuck, how did you get there the first time? Incremental, modular steps. Basic, boring, following the rules, doing this, expecting that, doing this, expecting that, one piece at a time. Think about it. Before you go into drawdown, you're not trying to do crazy shit. You're just trying to do what's the next trade. Do that. Stop. Make your money, be done, turn the charts off, wait for the next session, wait for the next trading day. It's business. But now you're looking at that same business that you now have a loss. You're in drawdown. You're looking up at that old equity high and you're telling yourself, this is going to be so hard to get back up to that. I just want to get through it really, really fast. And you're wrestling with these impulsive feelings that you got to get in there and just do really big trades because you just got to get through it. The quicker I can climb back up there, the better. When that's absolutely the worst mentality to have. You need to tell yourself the same thing you did before. I'm going to find my next setup based on the model. I'm going to risk less money. I'm submitting to the idea now because I have to do this at a longer duration. I've pushed my finish line further away from me in time because I've created this drawdown. The drawdown is not a, it's not an end of a career. It's a, well, it's a struggling point you have to wrestle through, yes. But the wonderful thing is once you go through that first drawdown, And you mitigate all of that, but you do so correctly. The worst thing you can do is go in there and YOLO 
you only live once type trading. They try to get it all back in one you know, fell swoop. It's over. Because what you'll think if you are able to do that by luck is that you're better than you really are. And that drawdown has not had any lasting impression on you to prevent you from being reckless in the future. So you're looking up at that peak, that equity high that you drew down from. Losing trade here, losing trade there, and now you're in drawdown. You're not to look at that and say, I got to quickly get back there. No, you don't. Because when you were taking your trades that got you there, you didn't say, I have to be there by this day. Nobody had that mind, mentality, that mindset. When you were getting to the equity high, you were just taking one trade, next trade, next trade. That's all you're doing. But now because you're in drawdown, your whole entire perspective about yourself, your abilities, and how it is that you're going to get back up there is completely distorted. That's what makes drawdown become a blown account. Not understanding that, that that mentality that you're now holding is extremely fragile. It's so brittle that the next trade you put on, you're going to be so hypersensitive to every little fluctuation that it's going to make you scared. You're going to be impatient about it. You will not be willing to sit through the stop being hit again. You're going to be more likely to not want to use a stop loss like he did on Friday morning. And then when you don't have a stop and it goes past what your stop would have been, you'll be wrestling with, well, if I get out, it might be just going just past where my stop would have been. And then it reverses and you start telling yourself that bullshit. You start giving yourself pillow talk on a one night stand. Oh, honey, I, yeah, I really enjoyed the time with you. Let me just stay a little bit longer with you. When really you just want them to fall asleep so you can sneak out. You know you shouldn't be in that trade, but you start doing pillow talk. Yeah, I'll be all right. It's, just, it's probably going to turn around. And the whole time it's just going deeper into you, running that sword deeper into you. And more damage is being done. And then finally you can't handle it and you get out. And then it moves in your favor. Not because your trade would have panned out, but because it's simply just doing something else. But your mind's going to see, oh, see, I did it wrong. And now you're going to go in there and chase it again. That's exactly what goes on in every trader's mind. When they're in drawdown, that's exactly what it is. So... The only thing that is actually good about this is it happened on a Friday. So it forces 48 hours of decompression. You have to take time. You have to reset yourself. You got to remind yourself with positive self-talk that nothing has changed. These markets are still going to book the same way they book all the time. They're going to run for liquidity they're going to go from premium to discount, discount to premium. They're going to run to inefficiencies. Everything's going to operate on time. You just did something incorrect. And this moment, because he's new, he doesn't have but just a couple of days of journals to look at. So he doesn't really have a, a plethora of experience of leaning back on when it was good. This is why it's essential for you to be demoing, but not doing the, the journaling. That way, when you start practicing with forward testing and you feel like you have encountered a period where maybe they changed the algorithm, <laughs> they're not changing shit, but you'll feel like everything's broke because you're just doing it wrong and you'll feel depressed. You'll feel like you're not getting it. You go back to your journal and you read those entries where you saw this coming, the chart looks like this and you feel better about it and it gives you the motivation It cheerleads you through it. He doesn't have that. So it's a lot harder for him right now because he's shamed, wanted to impress dad, wanted to do well, wanted to do something independent all of, all of, of himself. And then he did that. So $4,000 of what would be considered you know, drawdown is nothing. That's a morning session on a couple contracts for me. And 
I spent the afternoon on Friday basically explaining to him that, listen, like, even though Friday was a bit of a crummy day technically, like, it was a lot of give and take, a lot of give and take, spotty price action. It looked like I was watching the Dow futures when I was looking at ES. And when I was working with my older students, we were watching some of the uh, price action. It was just really weird. And I called out and marked out, you know, with them and my son, you know, several five handle runs here and there back and forth. And I told him, I said, listen, don't be afraid because you did this to be able to go forward. Don't let it bog you down to make you feel like you're going to never be able to do this because you're going to tell yourself all this weekend that you made a mistake and you want to be able to go back in time and never have done it. It's every, every trader's, you know, regret, you know, when they lose money, I think my dog see the deer outside. <laughs> the, uh, the, we all want to go back in time and not put, not push the button on that trade or start trading on that day when you knew really, really isn't anything in there to be trading, but you know, I got time and get in and push the button. Maybe, maybe I'll get lucky and get some kind of a win. All those things we know after the fact where hindsight's perfectly 2020 and you know you can go back and pinpoint what it is that you did wrong. He's experiencing that for the first time right now. He's, ha he's having to come to grips with nobody did it. Nobody did it to him. And he's looking for some way internally how he can take the responsibility and place it on something outside of himself just like i did when i was 20 and just like you listening to me even the people that say i'm a fraud and my stuff doesn't work you know that shit's the truth about you too you want to find some kind of external reason why you fucked up because it's uncomfortable and that's what this industry does it's a it's a perfect mirror it's better than the mirror when you go to your restroom and you look at yourself in the morning, brushing your teeth, getting yourself ready. That mirror just shows you a reflection of you. This industry shows you who you really are because you can lie in that mirror. You can comb your hair and put makeup on and shave your face and put uh, contact lenses on that are a different color. You can do all kinds of shit to change that. You can't wear a mask in this industry. All the masks fall off. As soon as you push that button, the real you is exposed. The real person inside of you, the person making the decisions, the one that's driving drunk behind the buys and the sells, that's it. That's the person that's responsible. And that sometimes is extremely difficult for an individual to take. It's extremely stressful. It's alarming sometimes when you discover, wow, I don't really have it all together. I thought I had it figured out. I had all these things you know, planned with all this success. And then when you put that trade on and you wrecked yourself and then you tried to fix it, not knowing what it is you're doing and then becoming impulsive Instead of realizing that, okay, I caused this situation, let me take a step back and slow down. That doesn't happen. It's speed up, do more of the same stupid stuff, and get worse. Why do you do that? Cortisol, adrenaline. And not knowing what you're doing. Remember, in your mind... It's the equivalent of you standing in your house with every wall on fire. The room you're in is filling up with smoke. It's an emergency. Outwardly, someone looking at you, they would never feel like that's what's going on inside your head. They happen to walk by, look at you at your trading desk. Yeah, you're in drawdown. Maybe you're not smiling, but they don't feel like you're going through any kind of emergency. But inside, the whole fucking world's coming to an end. And then what are you doing? You're trying to put out all those fires. That's what he experienced. That's what I experienced when every time I blew an account, 
That's exactly what you experience all the time, too. Send me a, a tweet and tell me, hell yeah, if that's exactly what you've encountered when you blew your account. And you'll see, you're not the only one. Everybody, everybody has gone through this at least a dozen times. Not just once, a dozen times. And until you get to that point where you know your model and you have mastered yourself, you know, 18 year old kid, especially a male, I mean, <laughs> he is, he's never going to be in control of himself. Not at 18. There's, there's too many chemicals, you know, being pushed through his natural development. I mean, he's at the, you know, he's at the peak of his testosterone, too, so he feels like he can do everything, like he's superhuman. And that's why it's a little bit harder of a prick to his ego and pride when any failure comes, because he thinks that it should be the same feeling he has when he does anything else and succeeds at. So it's good for him to be humbled. It's good for him to learn like he's learning right now. It's also good for dad, because I didn't give him money, because he would have probably spent more money in drawdown or blowing the account without me being there. So in a lot of ways, I'm very thankful that he, he took this initiative to go this route. And I think that's the reason why he wanted to do it because he knew his own impulses. He had it in his head. He didn't tell me, but I can tell you now, as I'm talking to you about and thinking about it, he had that in mind. He was, once he figured out what he thought he was going to be able to do, as soon as he felt that he could do that, when he was given the car keys without me in the car with him, riding shotgun, he was just going to go, he's going to go he'd drive to town and he was going to drive it until the brakes came off. And thankfully he ran out of gas and that threshold that they put you through or two and stop you. That's what he hit. So he didn't go off the bridge, but he hit a tree. So now he has damage that he has to get corrected. Still has the car to drive, 149000 of that funded account thing. But I think it's like 147 something. Okay. But uh, he has to be very careful. And I told him, I said, you know, you got to listen and don't do anything apart from me being next to you. You don't have to do a reset. Because he was saying that that's, that it, yeah, worst case scenario, dad. If I, if I would have blown it out, because that's what he was willing to accept. You know, we could just do a reset. I don't care. I, I'll, I'll do that. But I just wanted to get it back right away. Why? Why did you feel like you have to get it back right away? Because I felt like I had to get it back. It just felt like I had to. No, you were telling yourself that. Nothing has to happen. Nothing. Nothing has to happen. You have to be comfortable between trades. You cannot have any kind of overwhelming impulsiveness to get in there to make something back or make something more. If you're doing that, that's the improper mindset. You are gambling. I promise you, if you're listening to me right now, if you are unstable and highly emotional, impatiently waiting to get into a trade, the best advice I could tell you is go do something else for 30 minutes. Come back. If you miss the move, who cares? That's not the last trade it's going to form. But if you lose your shit about having missed that move, you are a gambler. You are absolutely an uncontrolled gambler. You feel like you got to be in every move. I'm not teaching you to do that. And yesterday afternoon, I basically sat down with my son and my older students. Have, you know, they were privy to what I was doing. I was showing him buying and selling up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And I said, listen, just because I can do this, just because I can do that, doesn't mean I sit in front of these charts and do that all day long. I want to pick my shots. I want to be able to do what makes sense to me, and I'm, I'm, the, the trade I know is likely to occur, and I'm not in a rush to get into, and everything lines up, and I have all the signatures I'm looking for, they're the ones I tweet to you. They're the ones 
that I'm going in and telling you, okay, I'm, I'm going long here. I'm taking a short. And they, boom, take off. Well, there's one. I, I did lose one. And I, I see people tweeting all the time. You did that on purpose. You took a long. No, I, I got it wrong that day. I'm not infallible. I, mean, I did it wrong. But most times I'm not doing it wrong. I'm calling it before it happens and there it is. But I showed him. I said, listen, just because I can do that, doesn't mean I go in there and go hog wild with it. it. It's not necessary. You need to master yourself. Just because you have the sword in your hand and you can swing it all around, doesn't mean that that's what you should be doing. You should keep it in its scabbard, unsheathe it, do one stroke. Yaido, it's, it's the art of drawing a sword. You pull that blade out. As you're drawing it, it's also a cut. You remove blood and then put it back in the scabbard the cut and the drawing of the sword is all one motion you're not out there like jason Voorhees and friday the 13th fucking swinging around like a machete trying to cut everything and that's exactly what you become a crazed homicidal fucking psychopath when you're in drawdown you literally have a machete in your hand and you think every candle sticks a fucking tree that you got to chop down this is the one i'm gonna do next Oh, yeah, you printed that? Let me go. And the whole time, you're hacking yourself up. You're not cutting anything down except for your equity base. And you don't even realize it because you're a crazed homicidal maniac because you did it to yourself. And you're looking at it like somebody else did it to you or something else did it to you. And you did it. You have lost the plot. You've lost control of yourself. And the only thing that fixes that, time. You have to separate yourself, move away from the stimuli that's causing you to want to do those things. Ground yourself, let the adrenaline and the cortisol burn off. It's going to take about a good 30 minutes. Cortisol lasts a little bit longer than the adrenaline. Adrenaline, several minutes and it's gone. Cortisol, it takes a little bit more time to burn that off. And then once you are in a proper state of mind, then you can deal with other things in your personal life and not be so snappy and punchy, ready to fight and have an argument. You won't feel like every little word that's being spoken to you has needles on it, pricking you. You won't argue with your spouse. You won't yell at your kids. You won't kick the dog. You won't get fired at your job. When you're looking at that drawdown and you're staring up at it like it's a mountain that you're never going to be able to climb back up and you have to hurry up and get back up there, like, like that's the thing that has to happen. Stop and listen to me for a second, okay? Nothing has changed. Everything is exactly the way it is right now and how it was exactly the same way when you were at the equity high. The system, the concepts, the methodology, and the way these markets book have not changed. The only thing that has changed is your perception about yourself, your own ability, and what you're going to do next. So you have a sense of heightened concern. You had a house fire. You want to hurry up and get your house restored. Does it happen like that in real life? No. You lose some things that you can't get back. That sense of I'm doing everything right, this feels great. This is a lot easier than I thought it was while you were making that equity high. Now you have loss. You didn't need to second guess yourself in the beginning, but now you have to second guess yourself. Am I going to do that to myself again? What am I going to do? If this, if this trade turns against me, how am I going to feel? See, now you have that in your, in your, in your mind now. And you're feeling it when you don't know how to trade, which causes a great deal of anxiety, performance anxiety. And it's easy to talk yourself out of ever staying with this when that happens. And a lot of people quit. A lot of people quit, but still push the button because they can't take themselves away from it because they're in a state of mind. They're impulsive. They're reckless. And they just aren't willing to 
wrestle themselves into discipline. They've already quit subconsciously. They know they're never going to be able to do it, but they just, they just want to push the button. Much like it, I mentioned before in a Twitter space, and I think I talked about it one time on a YouTube video lecture somewhere. On my first year honeymoon, I told you I took $100. That's all I had to take input into a, what do you call them? Uh, the slot machines. I could have brought more. But all I wanted to bring was $100 because I knew the chance of me making any money off of that is next to none. So I limited myself to 100 bucks, And I tried eventually after being there for hours trying to lose the $100. Like I was down, just wanted to be done with it. But I didn't want to walk away because I was like, you know, this is stupid. Like I just, I just want to lose it and be done. That's exactly what happens when you trade with the state of mind that my son has right now. You want to be able to say that you got pushed out of it by some external force. Yeah, stupid brokers. Yeah, stupid market makers. They did it to me again. They got my stop. Because then it makes it a lot easier to deal with. You didn't mess up. It was somebody else that did it to you. You didn't do anything wrong. When you did everything wrong. You did everything wrong. And you have no sense of responsibility. And unfortunately, in this industry, responsibility is always yours. It's yours. It's not mine as the mentor. It's not your broker's. It's not the funded account company. It's not the company that you keep. It's not your spouse. It's yours. And some people that come into my fold or in this industry don't ever have the responsibility that's required to be a trader. And when they are first introduced to that necessity of having responsibility by having losing trades, when they did it to themselves, oh, this stuff doesn't work. It's a fraud. It's a scam. Despite how many times have I shown you beforehand what's going to happen? You've seen me executing trades. You have seen me use a live account. It's on my YouTube channel. I showed you every day logging into it. I showed you losing trades. I showed you drawdown, correcting the drawdown, doubling the account in five weeks with one contract. But you didn't show 30 years of that. Get the fuck out of here. I don't need to. I'm showing you every day what it's going to do. Everybody that has a weak mind, they're going to manifest that outwardly in this industry when they suck ass. You can see who the weak people are, the people that chat too much. These things don't work. These things aren't profitable. These people are broke. They're in that state of mind that my son's feeling right now, and they never got out of it. They never got out of it. They're the guy that never got picked to be on the team. They're the last one picked, and they got a chip on their shoulder. My son has a chip on his shoulder right now, and I'm eager to see how he contends with that because he's extremely competitive, very competitive. He has told me to my face, and I love it. (laughs) He goes, Dad, I'm going to be better than you, and damn it, I fucking want to see it. I want to see it. I want to do everything I can to make that fucking happen. I want that. I want to see it. I hope I live long enough to see him smoke my ass and be able to do it way better than me. I want that. And how he handles this moment right now, this one here, it's like an ember. It's not a flame. It's just a small little ember. And I'm trying to handle it extremely delicately. I don't want it to go out, but also don't want to drop it into a combustible liquid that would turn into a wildfire. Because then you get reckless you know, screw jobs like you see on the internet. They're just wired differently now because they're, they're bent. They're not successful. They go around calling everybody a fraud. And they don't produce anything to show that they can be a trader that's consistent. The only thing to talk about is toxic stuff, pointing out anything that could be viewed as subpar, but not 
acknowledging the things that are working are being called in to account before it happens. I want to keep his passion burning. Like, I don't want to smolder it, which is why I said earlier, I want to jump his ass as his dad. Like, you fucked up. But it's not the right time to do that. When we get back to the equity high, then I'm going to chew his fucking ass out. He'll be in a better position because he can see, okay, yeah, I get it, dad. You know, I watched what we did to get it back here. It's fine. Now it makes sense. But if I kick him in his face, rip his you know, head off and shake him by the lapels while he's feeling what he's feeling now, the only thing that would do is make him feel worse about what he's done. And that's just going to compound that loser's mentality that could really stay with him longer and create much more of a hardship for him to learn because he'll have a scar. See, he's not looking at me as the reason that in, I didn't inflict the scar that he's going to have. I didn't create that for him. He's going to walk through his career now knowing that he himself did that. So I'm allowing this condition to do what it does in everybody, but also I'm going to coach him, encouraging him along as his dad and also as inner circle trader. Yes, it sucks, but you got to fucking suck it up, buttercup, because this is exactly what it's like the rest of your fucking career. When you go into drawdown, it is never fun. It's not fun, but I'm not, oh, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm losing money. I have a losing trade. Oh, this sucks. Fuck that. Okay, I got that one wrong. What am I going to do next? Done. Handled. I have a process. He doesn't have a process. You didn't have a process when you went into drawdown and then when you eventually blew your account. You had no, you had no process. You were in that burning house and you were trying to put out the house fire because you didn't want all of your loved ones' things and your things, the things that you – treasure in your life. You don't want to see them all go up in smoke because you can't replace them. That's exactly what you're thinking about with that equity high. You think that's a family heirloom that you can't replace. The fuck out of here. That thing is something that you're going to go past. All this is is a slingshot. Drawdowns are a slingshot. You go up to an equity high, you draw back to get more energy, and then let it go. Boom! New equity high. Eventually, you draw down again. Okay, that's no problem. I'm drawing down like a slingshot. And then, boom! New equity high. That's how this shit works. But when you first encounter it, you've been driving, you've done right, everything correctly, and then all of a sudden, you did something silly, you did something stupid, you pushed it a little bit too much, and you have a losing trade. Okay. Stop. Don't go back in. Wait till the next trading day. Give yourself some time. Remind yourself outwardly with your own mouth speaking it. Tell yourself there is no emergency. This losing trade is not an emergency. This is, this is not something that I have to contend with immediately. I don't have to put this out as a fire. It's not a fire. It's a flat tire. It's not a barbecue. Your fucking car's not on fire on the side of the road. You had a flat tire. That's it. Change the fucking tire. That's all. Change the tire and get back on the road again. You can't do that if you melt the fucking car down when it, when it you know, a car fire. You, you just can't do it. You have to get another one. Either reset the account or refund your account. That's not fun. It's expensive. So to avoid that, just let it be a flat tire. Stop. That's one losing trade. Okay, now you're, you're angry. You're pissed off. Are you in the right state of mind to take a trade? No. So you have to have that as a process. As soon as you take a losing trade, boom, stop. Get up, walk away. 30 minutes minimum. I don't give a fuck what you think you're seeing in the charts. I don't care what I'm talking about on Twitter. Oh, it's going to be a big day. It's going to do this. It's going to draw here. Stop. Turn my ass off on Twitter. Don't look at social media. Turn your charts off. Leave for 30 minutes. Minimum. And if we, when you come back, if you feel impulsive, like you've got to be doing something, you are in a gambler's mindset and do not absolutely touch anything. 
But it's hard to pick up on all that unless you put some time between your loss and your next entry. I promise you, your next entry is going to be impulsive. It's going to be just reckless, stupid shit. Everybody does that. Everybody does that on their first drawdown. Everybody does it. It's weird. It, I, I literally, it would be amazing if people would do a, a testimonial and say, yeah, this is what it was like, and try to walk everybody that would be willing to listen to it. I love it. Like, I would love it if there would be a channel on YouTube. I'm willing to be the one to do the first submission to it. What it was like on my first losing trade that took me into drawdown and I blew my first account. I would absolutely have no problem doing that with the expectation that other people would do it too. And you know what you would hear? It would be like someone saying the same thing from the same fucking script. It's amazing how it always happens. It's the same shit. What goes on in our mind, what we're thinking, what we're fearful of, what we have to do right away. It needs to happen right now, for fuck's sake. i got to get my money back. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. You don't need to do that. But you do when you're live streaming, and you got to make yourself look smart. You're going to prove to the world you can trade better than ICT. Fuck, maximum loss day. That was insane. <laughs> Man, I wish he'd start YouTube and live again. <laughs> Missing it. But the point is this. My son wrecked himself. No problem. You got a flat tire. You got a fender bender. It is what it is. Dad knows how to fix that. No problem. But I can't fix what he's holding on in his brain as things to worry about, what to focus on. That needs to be guided, instructed, navigated with proper encouragement, but still allowing for that sting I need that to be there for at least another week or so. Like he needs to fear himself, not the market. Because that's what it's like when this industry puts you through something like this. It exposes you. It doesn't make your method, the teacher that taught you, the concept itself, it doesn't make any of that any different than what it was before you did something improper. It makes you shine a spotlight right on you. You, the operator, the person that pushed that button, the person that opened themselves up to risk, you were the one driving the car. You were the one that got drunk. You were the one that caused all that carnage. And you have to own it. And some people that come to this industry aren't equipped to own it. They want to blame everything and someone else for their stupidity, their impulsiveness, their lack of self-control. And you have to own it and you have to be strong and identify it. as soon as you start feeling that way, identify it what it is. It's not weakness to stop trading. It's not weakness to go home and draw down. That is not weakness. That is absolutely the right way to do it. You have to be able to take losses. Go home with them. It's okay. The market's going to be there. Opportunities will present themselves again. And that equity high is not a family heirloom that you've lost in a fire. It's not an insurmountable peak on a mountain that you're never going to be able to get back to. It's not Mount Everest. I don't know if you ever noticed or did a, there's a lot of documentaries about uh, Mount, Everest, uh, Mount Everest, rather. And I, oh, fuck, I would never climb that place. I would never do that. I'm afraid of heights. I ain't going to be afraid to say it. I, I have where to go. And if I watch a video on YouTube where people are really high up, I literally feel like I'm falling off the couch. And I'm in, you know, I'm in my home. <laughs> but I literally feel like I'm going to fall looking like that. I can't, I don't have the ability to handle that. But you are not looking at that equity high that you slip down and draw down from and viewing that as Mount Everest. And listening to the documentaries about Mount Everest, there's a lot of people that climb up there and die up there and they can't go up there and get them. They just, that's where they drop. That's where they lay. 
and the, the cold temperature just keeps them, you know, how they were when they dropped. Just because you want to climb back up there again, you know, you don't want to die on the, the ascent. Much like a lot of people do trying to climb Mount Everest. Healthy, fit people have died climbing up there. They went too fast. You have to go up a little while. You know, rest. Let yourself get accustomed to that height. Same way when you're coming down. Much like a scuba diver. You, know, you go down, you have to go down at a controlled pace. You got to come up a controlled pace to allow the blood to regulate. Otherwise you'll get the, the bends and that's not fun. But that equity high that you fell from, you're going to go there again, but you don't have to go there right away. It's just like when you went to your favorite vacation destination. You went there, the drive was great. You couldn't wait to see the new equity high in your new trades. Okay, great. You get a new equity high. Wonderful. You show your wife, okay, big deal. It's a new high score. And then you want to impress her. What do you do? Take the next trade because you feel like you're right there. It's almost at that target I'm looking for. I, this is another thing I'd like to see. How many people did their ass in when they were just trying to get to a target that they had already assigned like, I have to get to this level. This is my target. And they may have got out of a trade that just fell short. Like, it just, I'm talking like 20 fucking bucks. Something so simple like that. I just missed my target. As a 20-year-old, I did stupid shit like that. I was trading copper one time. And I literally fell short of it. One, one point. And it, that would have been the, the number that I was aiming for. And there was time still left in the day. I said, all right, let me just go in here real quick and do one more. And that one single contract trying to get to that level, it was a losing trade. So what, it, what happened? The same thing happened with my son on Friday morning. Fuck. Well, let me, I got to get that back now. I don't care if I get my target today. I, I got to get that back because that, that's, that's just not going to be acceptable. So I did another trade. And it was another losing trade. So now I'm in the wrong state of mind, but I don't know this. I don't know enough about myself. I don't know that this is what goes on in the minds of traders that are now hopped up on risk and gambling. I'm not looking at if I get it wrong. I'm only looking at I'm going to get it right if I just keep doing it long enough. I'll get it back. And that's the wrong mentality because when you're distorted and you're all bent up and trying to pursue something that is not – it's not a really, it's not a viable trade. You're trying to impose your will. You want what you want. And what have you done? You grabbed your club as a caveman, walked out your cave, and you're looking for something to bonk over its head and drag it back to your cave and say it's mine. And that's what I did. And then ended up not making three profitable trades to get back the losses. Then I switched and I traded cotton and then <laughs> blew the account that day. All because I had a target that I was just one point away from. And I felt so certain that it was going to trade to that level and allow me to get to it. It was a pursuit to have my will, well, come to fruition. Not, is there really a trade here? <laughs> is, is there really a trade here that makes sense? No. Absolutely not. But I would love to hear stories like that from other traders where they just fell short of a target that they had to have. And they pushed the envelope. They pushed the trade. They pushed more trades because they had to get that number. They had to get that target. And they blew themselves. I know. I know I'm not the only one that's ever had that experience. I know. There has to be more of you out there that's done that. If you have, you just say, hey, I, I did that dumb shit too. <laughs> <laughs> and look, you know, look where you're at now, what you are learning. That wasn't the end of your career. That didn't do you in where you don't want to trade anymore. It's just it's an unfortunate thing. It was a car accident that, you know, you totaled that car. It sucks. I know. But it's not the end of it. You have to slow yourself down. Apply the brakes. 
I put some time in between the, you know, the last thing you just did to yourself that's caused pain, drawdown, an adverse result that you did not want to have, but now you're stuck with. So now how are you going to deal with it? Are you going to allow it? Is my son going to allow this to frame a toxic mindset going forward? Is he going to be fearful of things now? Is he going to be afraid to take trade entries now more so because, remember, that's how he started. He's afraid. And what did he do? He listened to my lecturing saying, this is how you overcome it. This is how you don't fear it. So he just plunged trying to overcome fear. But he tried to do it with his funded account, not the demo. He did the classic, I want to get in there and start making money. I got to learn how to trade with real money. If you want to learn how to trade, you got to start with a real account because demos don't do it. That's bullshit. And here's my own flesh and blood proving it. You got to listen to me, folks. You have to listen to me. I've done this to myself dozens of times. If anybody knows how this is going to happen over and over again, I fucking know. I'm qualified to teach that. <laughs> okay? I absolutely am certain that there is nobody out there better equipped to be able to say, look, these are the characteristics that's going to result in you harming yourself. And if you do the opposite of these things and do the things I tell you to replace these toxic views, you're probably going to stand a better chance of not having done that again or ever in the future. And that's a pretty good target to reach for if you're a new trader. If you've never blown your account, it's not, it's not required for you to do that. Like that's not something that we're sitting around, and I always use this analogy a lot, but in Jaws, the first one, you know, they're sitting in, their, in the cabin part, and they're all showing each other you know, the worst scars they got. They're always trying to one-up the next guy. You know how it is. You got a friend or somebody you know at work, Carl. He's, uh, he's got something that's much more than what you went through. Something better or something he had to endure that was worse than that. You know, that fucking kind of person gets on my nerves. Well, you don't need to do that with trading. You don't need to blow an account. Yeah, I blew an account too, ICT. Look at that. I got the war scar. Look at that. Fuck that. You don't need to do that. Who wants to do that? I want to create all of you monsters out here where you don't have that scar tissue and say, you know what? I didn't have to go through that. I want you to be able to say, I never blew my account. But the chances of that, I'm, I'm aware of that happening is very slim. But I know if I keep doing what I'm doing, invariably, there's going to be at least one of you. One of you will find consistency, profitability, and not having blown your account. But chances are it's going to be a very, very, very small, small number that get that. Because the human body, the human mind, emotions, and how psychology works – You'll have this experience like my son. You'll feel this impulsiveness where you think that there's an emergency. You created a drawdown, and that emergency in your head is not an emergency that's in the real world. Yes, you did something wrong. Yes, you don't have the equity in the account that you had before you did that. So what? When you put your trade on, guess what happens? You didn't have, at that moment, the same equity high. Commission's coming out. You're under a spread. You got to overcome that. You fell off your equity high. Maybe not so dramatically, but you got to put things in perspective. When you put a trade on, the trade might draw down intra trade. That means before stopping out and before closure. Guess what you're doing there? You're in drawdown. Are you losing your shit because of that? Some of you will be after drawdown. You'll be thinking it's the end of the world. Oh my goodness, it just moved it just moved six ticks. What the hell am I gonna do? Ticks, not handles. But you'll be so sensitive, hypersensitive to that. And it's hard to wrestle through that. I cannot, as a mentor, listen to me, folks. Okay. This is the reason why I teach this way. I cannot, as your mentor, I can't fix what you do to yourself once you get in that mind state or state of mind, rather. I, I, I don't have a way to fix what you have done emotionally and psychologically to yourself 
in how you're thinking and how you're talking to yourself. I'm not in your head. I don't know what you're saying to yourself. I don't know what you're convincing yourself was the real culprit that caused you to go into drawdown. But I can promise you this. It's not the things that you're thinking at that time was the real catalyst. It's not me. It's not the concepts. It's not the market. It's not the dealer. It's not the broker. It's you. It's always going to be you. When I got my CDL, a commercial driver's license, it's a younger man. One of the lessons that you, you learn as a, as a commercial driver is as soon as you get in a car accident, you are absolutely the reason why the, the, the accident happened, that you're the professional driver. And if there's a lawsuit because you caused an accident or you were part of an accident, lawyers love when there's a semi truck, a commercial driver involved. And they want to go through the whole process of looking at your logbook. And if your logbook isn't up to par, if you fake a logbook or if you do two logbooks, because back in the days, that's how it used to be. And you could run illegal long term and or not long, like long haul, long haul. And you could do a lot more hauls, which were illegal to do that. But long story short, they wanted to look at your logs. And if you lied on your log and you're saying that you were here at this time, and you, st- you came on duty, started driving at this time, but you are further away from that. That lawyer has a slam dunk case because he's saying, here's your logbook where you, this is a federal document now. Like you are logging this much like an airline pilot. Because uh, when you're driving a tractor trailer, this shit is a airplane on the ground without wings. So everything you're doing with this machinery is regulated. So if you're lying on your chart, uh, your chart where you're doing your uh, change of duty status from off duty, not driving to driving and you're speeding and you've been speeding for a while and you cover a lot more distance. If you get pulled over or have an accident, the trooper or the person that's going to be able to look at your logbook, he sees that there's no way where you came on duty and where you are right now, there's no way you could have done that. So he has a slam dunk case as a lawyer because if I was the lawyer, I'd go and say, okay, listen, you're absolutely at fault because by your own testimony in your logbook, it states that you were coming on duty in this town of this state at that time. How the hell are you able to be in this accident? If you came on duty there, that means you were speeding. If you're going to go into court in a situation like that, that lawyer is going to win every fucking time because he's going to say, if you were really doing this, this accident never would have happened, and my clients wouldn't be injured or have their property damaged. And that's exactly what happens to tractor-trailer drivers when they go to court. The lawyers always go through the logbooks because it's a slam dunk. Guaranteed that they're winning, and the driver may not have happened, been the real reason for the accident, but because that tractor trailer's in, in part of it, they're going to get it. They're the professional driver. The, the common driver, the four wheelers that are they're involved in these tractor trailer accidents, they're the ones generally are the ones that are causing the accident, but because they don't realize it takes a football field for a tractor trailer to come to a compl- complete stop. They do their brake checks into a tractor trailer, which is fucking stupid. You you don't realize that that's the reason how these trucks are not trying to run people over. But when someone gets in front of them and do dumb shit, they can't just stop these vehicles. It takes time. And they also want to live. They don't want to do something stupid and cause a jackknife. And then they they may not only kill themselves, but other people. And you're probably thinking, what the hell is this going to do with anything? The, The point is, Responsibility. Responsibility. Just like a tractor trailer driver, a commercial driver has to have full responsibility. Once they start that vehicle and they start moving it, they are at a higher level of accountability as a driver than you and I that drive around with a common Class C license. I don't have a a Class A anymore. I gave it up years ago, but I wanted to keep it because if I got an RV with air brakes, but my Class A doesn't have air brakes, so I don't need to keep it. And I have no interest in ever getting it again. But you have to be responsible. You have to know that when you cause this damage to yourself, you own it. And some of you 
just like some of these tractor trailer drivers should not be drivers. They're reckless driving and texting and doing dumb shit. And I did that stuff. I literally drove a truck with my left foot on the steering wheel, eating ramen noodles over the key bridge with high winds. And I was steering with my foot, eating ramen noodles. Why? Because I thought the fucking world was never going to be able to touch me. I was 20 years old. Everything was, you know, whatever. And I'm trying to trade the markets like that. <laughs> a cowboy. Cowboy up. Now, looking back at it, I, I, it, it scares me to think the dumb shit I did, which is reckless. And I had people calling into my company I was working for saying, your driver is driving down the road with his foot on the steering wheel steering and he's eating a bowl of cereal, which it wasn't cereal. It was ramen noodles. But the point is, is, you know, I told my boss then, you know, Glenn, he was like, uh, hey, are you doing that? I'm like, yeah, but I wasn't eating fucking cereal. (laughs) (laughs) The point is, you know, I, I owned it. Right. But it still doesn't change the fact that it was reckless. It was reckless. A high wind could have took me, you know, into the other lane, and I could not have over, you know, not over, but uh, I couldn't have compensated for that and steered it properly because I was using my fucking foot to steer while I was eating, which was dumb. But that's what arrogance is like when you're a twenty year old. You think you can just do whatever you can, and no, there's no consequences. There's no death. You don't have any concern about mortality, yours or anyone else's. And when you're young and you're in a market like this. That same type of reckless abandonment materializes. And now when you're met with drawdown, that cracks that sphere of invincibility, that force field that you thought you had all this time because you're young and you think you're going to live forever. And even if you break a bone, who gives a shit? You're young enough. It won't be that big of a deal. Now you lost your force field. Something got inside and touched you. And drawdown shows you how you're going to react. Not just then, but how you're going to react in the future every time you go through drawdown. And if you don't handle it properly or learn how to do it appropriately and talk yourself through it, remind yourself there is no emergency, you will be stressed out always as a trader, even being profitable. And that sounds like it could be technically impossible. How can you be highly stressed out, but still profitable? High stakes trading. High stakes trading. Um, I'm just going to say this and Tom Hugard, we've been talking in private and he knows that I, you know, I respect him and I'm not saying anything out of, out of place here. It's not to say anything bad, but I don't subscribe to his approach to trading because he bets a lot. He bets a lot and he's allowing himself and the people that follow him go through wild swings of profitability and drawdown, profitability and drawdown. And as a younger man, that would have been fine for me. Like I I didn't care about that. But over time, blowing out accounts and having just horrendous drawdowns and periods of not being able to turn it around. It made me not want to be able to do that. Like, I I don't want to stomach that. Like I want to be in precisely know what I'm looking for and not see those types of wild, crazy equity swings. So to me, high stakes trading is high stress trading. And it may feel euphoric when you win and you feel like you've, did an Olympic feat and you have technically, I'm not trying to take away from any of that because it really is impressive when it works. But the problem is, is you're going through that process and you're placing your body under so much stress, so much stress. When you constantly pump in cortisol, uh, cortisol in your body, it's actually having an effect on your vascular system the valves in your arteries and veins, all that stuff, it's beat up. It's not meant to have that. Like racing fuel in a car. Yeah, it's go, 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 baby, but it tears it up. Like you you can't do these 
these things to yourself long term and not have a consequence. My stomach, I tore up my stomach with acid because of stress as a young man that I literally could not even drink water without it hurting. I stressed myself out so much with this shit that I created an eating disorder. Went down to 150 pounds. I was 195 pounds and I was put together. Like I, I, I was Mr. Wonderful in, in my eyes. <laughs> but this industry changed all that because of stress. I couldn't eat and to be built, you have to feed the body. You have to eat. And I couldn't tolerate even drinking. And I went to insurers and I was literally on a liquid diet for a year and a half because I couldn't take physical food, which made me weak, which made me susceptible to getting sick more often. And that fear of eating food because of the pain created an eating disorder, which I carried for years. Where did it come from? Trading. Where in trading did it really stem from? Doing stupid shit that I tell you to avoid, but no one was telling me because I didn't have anybody like I'm talking to you. I didn't have that. And some of you folks that are listening to me that say, this guy fucking talks a bunch of bullshit. He talks too much. He's going on with all this horse shit. Get to the point. The point is, is you're fucking not ready. And the people that say, I don't like all his long rants and say, fuck you. Fail. Fuck you and fail. How about that? Okay? Because you are literally going to fall on your ass. You're going to go through these things. And you're going to have no recourse. You're going to have no reference to build up from. You're going to go through the same shit that I and everyone else that goes through it without any kind of coping mechanisms or skill sets. And you're going to fucking fail. And you'll still be working at your fucking jobs, making menial amounts of money, stressed the fuck out, wishing that it could have worked out for you, but it never did. Everybody's going to have drawdown. Everybody is going to get to that point where they push and push and push until the brakes fall off. Well, if the brakes fall off and you blow your account or you get to a point where you get stopped, like in these funded accounts, they have a breaking mechanism. Stop. You have no more authority to make any more executions today because you hit this threshold, whatever it is. I don't know if it's all the same for each company or not, but Cameron hit his Friday morning. Okay. So now what do you do? Do you lose your shit over it? Do you go crazy about it and start acting foolish? Going in there, maximum leverage to feel like if I can do it with maximum leverage, then I can feel like I'm a warrior again. I'm going to be a gladiator. I'm not going to be a little bitch. I'm going to get out there and trade even more aggressive. It's a battle, and I'm not a pussy. I'm going to go out there and do it the right way like a man. They're going to carry me out on a stretcher. Fuck them. I'm not going to tap out. Put me to sleep. That shit don't work in this industry, okay? <laughs> this ain't the fucking UFC. This shit is money. And money has a lot of influence. It has a lot of control. It has a lot of power over your mind. That's all it has, over your mind. That's why people try to keep up with the Joneses. That's why people get out on the internet and say they're super rich, multimillionaire, and everybody else is broke. They do that because they fucking are broke. They're not really wealthy. If they were, they wouldn't talk about it. But people listening to people like that, or people that rent cars, go to vacations and stay in certain places, wear watches that are not real, go to a Rolex store, sit next to the display, but then go buy a knockoff. <laughs> Put that on their social media. Yeah, man, I got this Rolex. No. Patek Philippe. That's a watch. Rolex is trash. But the point is this. Money has an influence. 
that has a negative influence and has a positive influence. And all I'm trying to be is a voice of reason and saying, okay, money's a fucking tool. That's all it is. It's a tool. But you are trying to handle it like a weapon. And the only person that's going to get hurt is you. And when you look at these equity highs that you draw down from, and you feel bad about how you got there. It matters not how you got there. What mitigating circumstances that led to you being there. You have arrived. You're here now. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to announce it to the world? And allow other people to critique that? Laugh and troll you? And compound that feeling that you went through it? And now you had other people coming in when they secretly suck ass and they can't do shit and they're Carl at work, but masquerading online like they're somebody special, highly opinionated, but they can't do shit, can't trade, can't fucking prove nothing. These people are going to make you feel even worse about yourself, which is why I say don't invite other people into your trading. Don't allow, you don't want to have anybody else's input. The only input that matters is your journal. That's the only one that matters. And if you take that drawdown and you treat it as an opportunity to improve yourself, improve on how you see yourself, how you see the market, and also to remind yourself, you know what? This was all self-inflicted. I'll say it again. This is all self-inflicted. Nobody pushed that button but you. You did that. You did it. Congratulations. It was fucking stunning how it happened. You did that all by yourself. <laughs> well done. Look at that. Nobody probably could have did it any better than you. Now, fix it. Don't be afraid of it. Because that's what trading is. Trading is you constantly doing patchwork, fixing flat tires, putting paint on nicks when you drive your car. Like, I, I can't stand leaving my, my vets anywhere. Like, I don't take them anywhere where I leave and go inside something because invariably, every single time I go somewhere, I, I, as soon as I get out, Guys will come over, hey, can I, do you mind if I take a picture with your car? And they have their friend, and they're sitting next to the front of the car, and they're fucking doing their gang signs and shit. And they, I mean, it's cool. I just don't want them touching it. And I don't want to go into a place and leave my vet like that, knowing that somebody might ding it with their shit or some piece of shit that's happened before where they run a key down it. And that's, just, that's, just, that's ignorant. That's ignorant as fuck just because you're broke as fuck and you can't afford something like this. I'm not flexing on you. I just drive my car and I went inside. But you come by and you key up somebody's shit like that. You're a piece of shit. You need to have your ass curbed. Yeah, I said it. That shit is ignorant. I don't even know how I got on that topic. <laughs> anyway, you have to own that. That drawdown is yours. You created it. And you now have to fix it. You have to do those things. Oh, the touching up the paint. Uh, like if, if you if you have a someone takes a, a shopping cart or their door of their own vehicle, they open up and they hit your door. It creates a dent and a ding. And it may take away some of the paint. Well, if you're a car person like me, you're not going to let that sit. So you're going to go get it fixed, put some paint on there and touch it up. Otherwise, it's an eyesore, right? Well, you have to do the same thing with your drawdown. You have to care about it. You have to care about that account. You have to nurture it. You have to treat it like a garden. You have to water it, fertilize it, give it everything it needs to grow, and keep the weeds out. What's the weeds? Toxic people when they're fucking opinions about you and your trading and your toxic thinking. That's the weeds. You got to keep the weeds out of your garden. Don't let choking thoughts about what you did hinder your next series of trades or your very next execution. 
because that's exactly what he's going to be feeling the next time. Even with me standing next to him next week, he's going to be thinking, if I say this is one here, what's dad going to say? And then you think he's going to stop with that? No, here's what's going to happen. And this is exactly what you've done too. He's going to say, all right, dad's teaching me to look for this in the chart. I think I see it. I see it, but I don't want to say it because if I say it to him, he's going to say no. And then he's going to be thinking, if I did it wrong there, dad's going to be thinking, I don't know how to do this at all now. Now I'm going to feel like I got to do it better than I already feel like I got to do it better because I'm in drawdown. He's going to overthink every fucking thing. What is that? That's a weed. That's a weed. So Monday... I'm going to be coaching him on how to just observe no button pushing and maybe Monday and Tuesday, but Monday, no button pushing, no entries, no nothing. I need him to be able to look at the chart, tell me what he thinks he sees and have no button pushed. So there's nothing that has to have a transaction scorecard at the end. It can't be measured as a bad thing. It can't be measured as a good thing. It goes back to the equivalent of a demo or not even so much as a demo, it's tape you're reading. He needs to be reminded that the stuff works still, but it's got to be in the hands of the capable. He's not capable. He's capable of drawdown. You've seen that. Everybody's capable of that. But most people in trading are not equipped to mitigate drawdown. And it's not because it's impossible, but it's because of the toxicity that the trader brings into it. You have to recognize these patterns that repeat in your psyche, the way you think, the way that you operate, what makes you push that button? These are the things that you have to journal. You have to physically write these things out. What was the catalyst that caused you to have the confidence or the impulsiveness And you have to be honest when you do it, put that in your journal. What was the reason that you got into the trade? Not just the technical things you see in the chart. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, what was the catalyst for you to want to take that trade? You want that trade to make you money. What were you thinking about that caused you to want to take that trade? Was you feeling like you're going to miss the trade or fearing a missing of the move? Or are you aiming for something monetarily as a target because you want to buy something or pay off something. Those things, that you want to include all that in your journal. Much like I mentioned earlier, when I was trading copper as a young man, I fell short of a target and I wanted to hit that target. So the trades I took after that trade closed before I hit my target, I just fell short of it one point. And then it started a series of trying to get something so minuscule, boom, wrecked. A couple trades in copper, didn't work. Let me go to a different market. Cotton, yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> Smoke that account. Said long short, long and short of it is you have a responsibility to be in a constant state of control over yourself. Which is why young men and women, if you're out here and you're smoking weed and shit and you're trying to trade, you're doing it wrong. You have to be 100% lucid. You want to do that shit on the weekend? I'm not hating on you. But you can't be doing that while you're trading. If you're drinking, your state of mind's changed. You can't do that because you're medicating yourself. You have to be comfortable in your own skin. And unfortunately, a lot of people aren't comfortable in their own skin trading because all their bad shit comes up, bubbling up to the surface. And then you lie to yourself and everybody else that can see it. And you say it's the other things outside of you that caused it. Oh, this happened to me because of that. No, you did it. You owned it. And that's what makes this industry ugly and that's what causes people to become ugly because they can't handle that stuff in themselves so they project outwardly to other people trolling 
talking shit about other people and they can't do anything. And they're miserable. And that's what happens with people that can't overcome trading properly and healing drawdown and losing trades. If they can't let go of the business, they become a troll. That's just the way it is. That's what happens. And that's unfortunate because they, they don't even have enough strength to walk away entirely. So they want to punish other people thinking it makes them feel better. When the whole time, the people that they're throwing are laughing at them. Like, dude, you're, what are you going to do? You're talking shit. You ain't done nothing. I and you that have a losing series of trades or go into drawdown, we're not losing our shit saying, oh, trading doesn't work anymore. I'm quitting. We're not affected by that. It's a paper scratch. That's it. Or a paper cut. It's a scratch, a little flesh wound, big deal. But when you start taking these in significant little minor setbacks, which is what a losing trade or drawdown is. If you still have your account, it, it's fine. It's not fun. It's just opportunity now to do the work that's required to fix that drawdown. And you don't have to be in a rush to fix it. There's no timeline or limit that you have to have in mind to get that drawdown recovered. So now, much like when I set out with uh, my son when he chose to start this funded account, I said, listen, they say you got to at least trade five days. Let's just establish two weeks. We'll give yourself two weeks to get to the funded stage of this. That way you don't have to do too much. It'll be easy to get it, It'll be easy to, to do each day, do it and stop. It'll be a good pace and it's comfortable. So now I got to tell him you got two weeks to get yourself calibrated again mentally and restore it back to where it was. And I wanna, I'm really interested to see how he handles that. Because he has to do it next to me, I'm going to be the control mechanism that prevents any impulsiveness. But I can't remove what is always going to be in his head, which is the fear of doing it wrong now, the judgment he thinks I'm going to cast on him if he thinks he sees something and I tell him no, is he going to be thinking about me overthinking why he got it wrong? Yes, that's exactly what he's going to be thinking, but I'm not. I'm aware of it now. I'm telling you publicly that's what he's going to be doing, and that's exactly what you do to yourself. When you go into drawdown, your next series of trades while in drawdown, you're hypersensitive to everything because you know you are capable of ruining yourself. And you have to be responsible. Slow down. Less is more. There's no time limit. You don't have to get it back right away. Give yourself time. Schedule it. Schedule it. If you have drawdown, say for instance, you know, say you have drawdown equivalent to what he put himself through on Friday equipment like four thousand dollars okay four thousand dollars give yourself four weeks to fix that do you need the four weeks no you don't but in your journal you tell yourself i have given myself permission to take up to four weeks to mitigate this drawdown guess what that does guess what it does when you do that it frees up that overwhelming desire to do it right away. You've wrote it out in your own words. You wrote it. You didn't read it in a book. It isn't a tweet that I sent out. You wrote that. You gave yourself subconscious permission to wait for a deferred event of mitigating that loss over a span of four weeks. You push it out in time so it doesn't linger over you like a dark cloud that forces you to take a trade that may not even really be there. Now, $4,000, let's strip this back into a modular perspective. What do, what do we have to do to get that? Well, four weeks, $4,000 is $1,000 a week. That's 20 handles on one contract. 
per week. Well, shit. That's only four handles one time per day. Easy, isn't it? What's hard is waiting for the move that sets up that four handle run and then stopping. Because you've given yourself four weeks in time to mitigate that. But ICT, shit, man. I'm in a competition to be on the FTMO leaderboard. Fuck around with this stupid shit. I'll never get back up there. You're trading to be on a leaderboard instead of becoming consistently profitable. You're fucking gambling. You're doing it for all the wrong reasons. You're doing it for pomp, for clout. And you're wrecking yourself. You will wreck yourself like yin and yang boy in Texas on his live streams trying to prove something. The only thing you're proving is you can't fucking trade. Now, you want to do that? Go right ahead. Well done. But that's not the right way of doing it. When you're in drawdown, you have to be very careful how you manage yourself psychologically and emotionally. You have to be the cheerleader for yourself. Nobody else is going to do it. And you do that through your journal. You have to keep yourself accountable. The only one that's going to be doing that is you. And how do you do that? Through your journal and writing out what you're doing. Your drawdown. How much money are you in drawdown? You're looking up at that peak, that mountain, Mount Everest drawdown. Okay? You're looking up there. All right. 153,400 and whatever it was. Okay? How do we get back up there, Cameron? How do we do that? You give yourself time. Take that time and be... Well, an ample amount of time, much more time that's required, which frees you up psychologically. Now, think about how it was when you were in university or when you were in grade school. You know that there's going to be a final coming. And all the studying that would be required, the students that are taking this education seriously, and they don't want to be stressed out the last minute, they're doing a little bit of studying each night, 30 minutes. Throughout the semester, throughout the quarter of, of their learning, right before we get to the final, those diligent students, the, the Koreans and the Asians in my class were always teaching me how their parents told them how to study. They didn't wait for the last day or two right in the final where everybody else tried to fucking cram it in the night before stress the fuck out and when i was in high school no dose was a thing everybody went out and bought no dose which was basically caffeine to that way they can stay up and cram all that stupid shit all these months and weeks of stuff you can't do that you can't do that and not be stressed out and you're not retaining it all. So don't do that same mentality with trying to recover your drawdown. Don't try to push it all right now. It's got to happen right now. I got to have it done next week. I got to get back up to that equity high. No, you don't. No, you don't. There is no fucking deadline. But in your head, because everybody's on social media, everybody's showing the best of what they've done, not full scope of what it is they've done. Draw down, losing trades, stop doing live streams because they can't fucking trade and now nobody can see what they're doing to themselves. You have to be 100% responsible. But you also have to, in periods of drawdown, you have to coddle yourself. You have to prop yourself up, encourage yourself, and be Constantly reminding yourself that there's no emergency or sense of urgency to get this drawdown back. The only person, the only person that's uncomfortable holding on to that drawdown is the retail Rick in you, the gambler. They want to get back to that high, that first buzz of being at that new equity high. They want to get back up there. They're the one inside of you that feels the ache of getting back up there. The trader doesn't have that feeling. The trader is the person that's p pushing the buttons and managing the trade. And the analyst ain't worrying about it because that's not their job. 
Their job is to keep you on the straight and narrow. They're not worrying about the feelings of drawdown. They're saying, this is what we're supposed to be doing right now. The trader is, this is what I'm doing based on what the analyst is telling me I should be doing right now. And I'm managing risk. Retail, Rick, is in the back fucking clamoring to get the steering wheel. He wants to drive into a tree. He wants to jump airborne like the Dukes of fucking Hazard. Remember the old show in the 70s? I love that show. <laughs> I grew up watching that shit. I'll be honest with you. As a kid, I couldn't wait to get a car because I wanted to jump every fucking hill out there. Now, I was being primed to do all the wrong shit, right? Just like in trading, we're primed to do everything wrong. Recklessly trading and try to gamble and get it all back in one day. And that's all the wrong way. You think if you can get the drawback, drawdown back quickly, you're a better trader. No. You're just a lucky gambler. Lucky gambling is not impressive to me. I'm not impressed by that. Someone can trade with crazy fucking leverage, make lots of money doing that, and I'm fucking bored to death by that. Because people do that same shit with lottery tickets, and there was no skill in them buying that ticket. There was no skill when that person going to the slot machine, pushing the button, and they got the maximum payout. There was no skill involved. They were at the right place at the right time, and circumstances just led to that occurrence. There it is, boom. That's it. It's done. No skill in over-leveraging, YOLO trading, but consistently able to see something over and over and over again, delivering that, that absolutely impresses me. If someone were to sit out there with one contract and just slice and dice based on a model that was already pre-described as this is what I'm going to do, I'm only going to do this, and this is how much I'm willing to risk, and I'm never going to go over that. And this is my procedure of taking a loss. If I take a loss, I stop for that session. I trade the next session or trade the next day. And they stuck to that, and they only made 50000 for the entire year. I'm fucking impressed by that. To me, that's skill. That's absolute 100% skill. Full 100% responsibility. They own it. They're in control of themselves. Their capacity to stay on track within a model is – Perfect. That is much more impressive to me than how much money. How much money is – it's relative. It's, it, who gives a shit? As a trader, I like seeing people that can own their mistakes, don't become reckless, go in there and start trading with a lot of you know, leverage to try to fix something real fast on a small little move. That's just gambling. That's gambling. And I'm so against that idea. That's what makes me boring as a mentor because I'm teaching my students to aim with very, very small targets. In the beginning, you start there. And for the people that have a brain, they can understand that that's all that would be required to have a really amazing career. If you can consistently find five handles, how many times does the market move around and offer five handles inside of a day. Several. You're not limited to that one, but you have to know what one looks like and find it consistently. And then you grow in your understanding about yourself, how you're going to react, what you're looking for. Boom, other models make themselves available to you. And then you can start seeing 10 handles a day per session sometimes. And then 20 handles in a day or more. And it need not be a runaway directional move. You can trade up and down and trade intraday without a bias. But you can't trade without an intraday bias in the beginning because you don't know what you're doing, which is the reason why I tell you focus on directional trading in the beginning. Not because that's all you should do, but you have to have a baseline to grow from and then be able to track your progress. And when you go into drawdown, you go right back to basics. Go back to the basics. What are we in? Are we in a bullish day or a bearish day? I want to focus there. What time of the day am I looking at? Okay, I'm going to wait till it's really easy for setups to form. What does that sound like in ES? What's the easy setups? What's the, what's the silver bullet for fix and drawdown ICT? You've been talking a lot of bunch of shit here, Val, and it might be entertaining for me. I might have chuckled a few times, but you know, get, to the, get to the brass tacks already. Tell me something. I've sat here and listened to this shit for a little while. Give me something to go home with. 
Okay. When you're in drawdown and you really simply just got to have the fucking trade that you can trust. That silver bullet trade that you want. Where does it happen? Where does it form? And also, how can I use this even when I'm not in drawdown? Where it forms consistently. Where does it form, ICT? Come on, spill the beans, man. All this build up, all this bullshit, spill it. That's my cards. See that? <laughs> I'm such a dick. <laughs> Between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning, New York local time, you will find a fair value gap that will deliver five handles every fucking day. Guaranteed, absolutely fucking guaranteed. It's never going to be a day, even on a shit show day like on Friday. It will always, always be there aiming for an opposing pool of liquidity. Sell side or buy side. In my head, when I'm waking up, sometimes my wife prevents me from getting in front of the charts right at 930. Now, she's understanding because I've been mentoring you the days I tell you I'm going to live stream. She graciously gives me that time to be here when I'm here with you. But sometimes we stay bit me, you know, we may be in bed longer in the morning because we stayed up later. Or we may do something because of homeschooling with our kids or something with the dogs. You know, something prevents me of being there at the 930 opening. I know as long as I get to my charts by 10 o'clock and I can stay there till 11 o'clock, I can take something out every fucking day. Every day, every day, even on days that have the shortened holiday schedule. You know, when they close it like at noon. Don't believe me. Don't take my fucking word for it, folks. Don't believe anything I just said to you because I want you to go into your charts and you'll see it's always there. Absolutely. Guaranteed. 100%. It's always there. There's your silver bullet. There's your pasture funded account bullshit. There's your fucking win the Robins Cup model. There's everything you're looking for between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. It happens every day. One minute. 30 seconds. 15 seconds. There's your two, there's your three time frames. It will form in one of those three time frames. All you have to do is wait for the obvious run on liquidity. Is it going for buy side or sell side? And if as long as it's giving you at least a range of six handles or more, you'll get your five. What does that mean? As long as that fair value gap forms on a 15 second, 30 second, or one minute chart, and you know where it's reaching for, it can be late in the move. I don't give a fuck. That's not chasing to me. Because a fair value gap, guess what that is? It's in the middle. That's where the meat is on the bone, baby. See, you're looking at charts thinking you have to have that end joint, high part of the bone or the low part of the bone. Precision is not limited to that. When you look at a chicken leg, okay, where's all the meat at? It's not on the ends. It's in the middle. It's in the middle. It's in the bulk point, uh, bulk end of one of those ends of the leg, but to the middle of the bone. And you get down to the opposite end. It's thinner. It's not a lot of meat down there. So it's a tendon down there. Nobody likes to eat that. A fair value gap is how you enter a trade that's in motion. Technically, to the uninitiated, the people that don't know how to read price outside of our circle, they look at what we do as, oh, it looks like chasing price. ICT, you did a revenge trade. Get the fuck out of here. You have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what I'm doing to get in those trades. None. You're learning this year, but it's not chasing price. If I know that this is going to run for liquidity and it's already moved and I missed the best case entry, and we've already had a fair value gap that it's repriced down into. It's not going back down if I'm bullish. It's already done what's required. Then I'm going to drop into one minute, 30 second, 15 second, and I'm going to look for a fair value gap. And the next one that forms, I'm in that bitch. Boom, take off. Get my five handles or even more, whatever the difference is between where that fair value gap is forming to the liquidity I'm aiming for. And I submit to that. I let it. Go. And then the algorithm sends it. 
And then I go on social media and say, wow, how random. I banned the guy this morning. I saw him. Uh, I, I retweeted a student. Um, a woman said, it feels so good to see cherries go in my favor. And because we don't have a lot of the women in this industry, at least, I mean, I'm sure there's more of them, but they just, they're not as vocal on social media. They're usually you know, the quiet, timid ones, and they don't want to draw any special attention to themselves. Uh, the women that do, and they announce that they are seeing progress, I like to retweet them. Now, this person said, I'm getting real fucking tired of seeing all the gloating. Fuck you. That's why you're banned, bitch. I'm encouraging that person and other people because they're saying what they're experiencing. You don't like other people succeeding? Go fuck yourself. Go fuck yourself, you miserable pieces of shit. Around here, we're making winners. And I'm encouraging that type of mindset where discovery of oneself and the ability to be able to do well. And they see progress. And they want to announce it to me and say, I appreciate what you're doing. And it's working in my life. I see the results. I'm moving forward with progress. And I'm thankful. I'm appreciative. I'm not gloating, bitch. I'm celebrating them. And I'm putting, I'm putting a spotlight on them. So other people in this community that might not be having that moment yet, they see it and say, you know what? Fuck yeah. I'm sticking around because I'm getting mine just like that. I'm encouraging. I'm not fucking gloating. Fuck you. How's that work for you? That's why I'm banning you bitches that say that shit. I ain't got time for the clownery, motherfuckers. You're talking all this chit-chat shit. You ain't done nothing. You don't trade. You don't show shit. You don't call no fucking moves. You're all bullshit. Sock puppeting little bitches. My students, I care about. I want to see them do well. I want their mindset fucking jacked up. Motivated. Not some weak ass, oh, it's random. You gotta hopefully get lucky. Fuck that. We don't use luck here. Luck don't fucking have any part of this equation here. We have a process. We know what the fuck we're doing. We know what we're looking for. We know when opportunities are arriving. It's scheduled. Retail fucking ricks out there, they don't know where the fuck this shit's coming from. They don't know when their indicators are gonna form shit, their triangles laying over top, their fucking chart hiding price. Moving average crossovers, all kinds of Mickey Mouse shit on their charts. They have no idea what the fuck's coming until it happens. And then they're reacting to price. Your job is not to predict price, but to react to it. And they shit themselves. They have no idea what the fuck's going on. None. They don't champion themselves when they do well because they don't know when the next fucking trade's going to be panning out for them. I do. My students fucking do. You're on the wrong team, motherfuckers. You're chatting shit to us. We are fucking killing it. We're winning. We are winning consistently every fucking day we're calling this shit. It's happening. Where the fuck are you at? What channel are you watching? How can you not be seeing what we're doing every day and not walk around on a fucking high? Like, we're walking on sunshine every fucking day around here. Think about that shit. Do you see us sitting on fucking social media sulking about how our market did, did, just did something that we didn't see coming? Fuck no. None of that shit happens around here. This ain't fucking clown world. We know what we're doing. We are trained to look at price with the spirit of anticipation. We're not reacting to shit. We're waiting. Our scope is already dialed in right at a specific time of the day. Right at a level we know it's going to be fucking delivered to us. And once it happens, fucking fireworks. We know exactly what the fuck we're doing. We are not wondering what's going to happen. We are waiting for it. We are fucking waiting. We can't fucking wait. Put it on a platter for us because we're going to take it home. That's how we operate around here. We are trained fucking killers. This motherfucker has nothing against us that we can't handle. Not one thing. Not one fucking thing that these markets do is a surprise to us. Now, who do you want to fucking listen to? You want to listen to some fucking loser logic where they're waiting for some stupid fucking indicator to plot something. You don't know when that's going to fucking happen. You're standing at your chart waiting for that shit to happen versus the chart, the open high, low, and close in the time of day that this shit forms. That makes perfect fucking sense. When you go to work, 
Does your start time fucking vary? No. Your boss is saying, bring your bitch ass to fucking work at this time or you're going to have it. Or you ain't getting paid. This business operates just like that. Everything is delivered by time. I give you windows of opportunity to go in and study because you're going to learn exactly when they repeat. There's small little windows within the time frame that are my kill zones. I'm giving you the opportunity to focus your attention there. And some of my better students have done really good research and seen exactly where I'm leading you to. And they see it happening every day. It consistently delivers. There's no reason for you to look at any kind of drawdown and think, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You're going to fucking trade. You're going to fix it. But you're going to compensate for that level of stress that you just, you just brought on yourself by having the drawdown. See, it's taking your mind away from the process that you've submitted to originally. But now drawdown, losing trades, has caused you to doubt yourself. That's all that has done. That's the only thing that's changed. Your confidence has now been marred, but it's okay. It's okay. Nothing has changed. Everything still operates just like it did before you were losing trades. The only thing you did was allowed yourself to get off the rails. Take yourself away from the markets. Slow down. Calibrate yourself. Think about what it is that you started doing this for. Go back to your model. Read it out loud. Meditate on it. Go back and look at your journal when you did things correctly. Remind yourself that you know what you're doing. You just did things emotionally. You chased something that wasn't the trade. You chased fixing an emotional response to an error that you made as a human being. And then you compounded that with recklessness. That's the only thing that took place. There is no emergency. Your model didn't stop working. You're not even looking at your model when you're trying to fix what you've done to yourself. So it's not the model that's broken. It's the operator that's drunk. Think about it. You know what I just said is true. What made you money before? You got to go back to that. When you're trying to fix drawdown in panic in front of the eyes of other people that watched you draw down live on your live stream, as soon as you start doing your 40 contracts and bullshit, retail Rick's in control. And now you become entertainment. Think, man. I know you don't like me. I know you don't like the fact that I'm doing way better than you and everything, but I'm talking to you. You can fix what you're doing. And you fall victim to yourself all the time. You do it to yourself and you get mad and you direct and deflect that to me. And it's self-inflicted. You do it to yourself, man. And it's easy fix. Everything I said here tonight, easy. Hard for most people to do it, but it's easy to fix. None of these things are reasons for you to be ending your career. Drawdown is not an end to a career. A blown account is not an end to a career. But each time, one of those things, if not both, will happen. And when it does, it changes and replaces the optimism that you had when you first started learning. And you had winning trades that led to equity high and equity high and equity high. You need to go back and tap into that. And I know it's hard. It's hard to do that because you are mad at yourself. You're embarrassed if other people know that you did it to yourself. But that's fine. That's every, everybody does that. In every aspect of life, you do something silly sometimes all the time. You know, that sense of embarrassment or shame, you're gonna, are you going to willfully carry that every day? Now that you're trading, are you going to constantly measure yourself on that drawdown that you put yourself in or that account you blew it. Come on. Be practical. Your spouse that you're with, 
you know, do they constantly bring up the thing you did wrong that one time? If they do, that's toxic. That needs to be corrected. It makes a relationship hard. Are you going to do that with your relationship with the marketplace and your model? Constantly go back and pull up that bad episode. Yeah, you know, you did that trade right. But remember that one time when you did everything you drove down and then you feel like shit. You have to nurture yourself emotionally and psychologically and keep all these things that are outside interferences to distract you or make you feel less about yourself. You need to keep that out. That's the weeds. Don't let weeds grow in your garden. You have to prune and till the ground constantly, looking for things that are going to be a distraction to you, that's going to be an impediment to your development and take you out of the mindset that's required. Now, obviously, in this one, I mean, I'm speaking from a stance of bravado, you know, because I'm confident and you as my students are confident because you know what we do here is on another fucking level. But I don't want you to feel like, because you may be a, a, a quiet personality. You may be a, a, a woman that's, you know, up in age and you may hear me get on this and carry on like I did. That's just the way it is, folks. I mean, I'm passionate about it. I'm reminding you all. You're at the right place at the right time with the right person. And there's no reason for you to ever doubt what you're learning or doubt yourself. You just got to keep showing up every day. But I don't want you to feel like you got to go out on social media and try to be a fucking gladiator against everybody else that doesn't do what we do. That's, that's the part about our community I don't like and other people don't like. I don't like that. And I know that there's people that don't like me that are you know, they're, they're pretending to be an ICT student or someone that likes me putting the bullshit in their profile, but they're really my trolls. So they want to kind of like perpetuate this idea that our community is toxic. Our community is arrogant as fuck. Yes, we are. We are arrogant. We're extremely confident because we're not guessing about anything. And that unfortunately unsettles everybody else that doesn't do what we do. And I don't give a fuck if that hurts their feelings. I don't care. I'm not out here like I used to be on Twitter. I used to literally go knock on everybody's fucking door, say, hey, you're full of shit. Your stuff don't work. Why aren't you fucking proving it? Just call something out. Do a fucking analysis. Tell me something. What's the market going to do? Oh, you're an asshole. You're a demo baller. Okay. <laughs> I had fun with that. I'm not doing that now. But see, you're learning the real mechanics behind what makes, what makes these markets move. And that's upsetting everybody. Because the more I do this and the more I prove it, and I'm bringing students that are fucking taking down fortunes with real money. You see these people saying, oh, these are paid actors. The companies are interviewing them. They're the ones paying them. They're being interviewed. They have their receipts. Ask them for it. I'm directing the audience that watches my videos to them. You have questions? Ask them. I'm sure they'll share what they want to share with you in terms of the proof. They don't need to have any more proof. The companies themselves that paid them out in their titles, $122,000, $200,000, thousand. they paid these people from their money. They got payouts, $40,000, $76,000. That's not market replay bullshit. It's not demo dollars. That's the really real. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's proof that this is a concept that's transferable. Do you need to make that kind of money? No. Should you aspire to? Sure, absolutely, and more. But you don't just jump in thinking that's how it's going to be. Because that's what gets you in periods of drawdown, chasing something. And don't, and I've been telling my private uh, students all the time, do not listen to these testimonials and think that I need you to do the equivalent or more because that is not what I'm telling you to do. I'm just saying I gave an open invitation to anyone that's using what I've taught. If they want to make themselves known and have an interview, their face will be seen, their voice will be heard, and their 
social media information will be made public and I will draw attention to them. So the audience members have an opportunity to talk to them themselves. That's not a paid actor. That's someone that's done it. That's made money. <clears throat> and you may not want to do an interview and done very well. And I have lots of them. They don't care about supporting other people. And guess what? There's not, doesn't make them a bad person. They have their own life. They have their own prerogative about what it is they want to do. A lot of you are already saying many times, you know, when we're done in November, you're getting off of Twitter. You don't have any other reason to be there. <laughs> I won't be on Twitter. My account will be there. That last post will be there. No tweets will be deleted. No videos are coming off my YouTube channel. But my level of engagement with all of you will be very, very, very low. I need that. And I don't mind working hard this year to earn that. But when I step back, it's not because someone rolled me off of Twitter. It ain't because I'm afraid of anything else. It's because I'll be 51 in August. And I am looking at the time that I have left here. And I don't want to spend it like this. As much fun as it is, I have asked my family to spend far too little time with me because of me doing this. And it's been unfair. And I want them to have time with me. Because tomorrow's not promised to no man. You know, I, I could be snuffed today. Taken out. I saw a, a comment someone shared to me from a dickhead from Texas in his comment section. Someone made a comment saying, I thought for sure ICT would have been killed by now by doxing his address. What kind of shit is that? Like, really? Listen, I understand I rub people the wrong way, but to incite people to want to knock me off, first of all, I don't give a fuck if you do. Instant death, instant glory, I know where I'm going. But I don't live in fear with that shit. But that's the level of toxicity. And Pat, you know, I understand you mentioned on Twitter, you know, uh, you get a lot of feedback from people that claiming to be an ICT. Uh, and yeah, I know you say you don't listen to spaces, but I know you do. Um, when you say there's things that are coming out of our community that are you know, shit being said to you about it. Dude, that's the flavor right now. That's the only thing they can do is to try to make us look bad. And I'm asking all of you as my community, if people are talking shit, the best thing you can do is ignore them. Don't give them any attention because that's what they want. They want that heat. They want that constant stimuli because they suck. And when you argue with them or you try to defend me, you don't need to defend me. Shit, I'm already fucking proving it. My students are proving it. The market's being called. I'm pushing buttons. Everybody sees it. The bottom line is, is it is what it is. And let them choke on it. Don't even give them any fucking time. And when I talk about things like this and people try to mother me, it would be better if you didn't talk about it, ICT, blah, blah, blah. I'm actually answering someone that sent me a message that they're wrestling with because they saw something that has them on the fence about trying to start here. I saw this person talk about you. And it's just, what can you say about that to help me get past it? And then I'll respond and I'll say that. It's like a blanket statement because I know the more time I spend out here doing this, the opposition will constantly put more bullshit out there. And all you have to do is show up every day. If I don't know what I'm doing, if these things don't work, you'll find out on your own. You don't need somebody else to tell you that. You determine that from your own opinion. Don't sit here and sign on the social media, whether it be on YouTube or Twitter or anything else, and take somebody else's opinion about me or anything and simply adopt it. That's the problem with social media. Believe me, I can't wait to get off of Twitter in November. I can't wait because it's, it's, it's just fucking toxic. Not because of the community. I don't, I don't care. You know, people talk shit about me all the time. But when I sign on the, the Twitter, the things that are being suggested to me because it's political bullshit or people smearing this one in the campaign or that one, you know, it's just toxic as shit. Like it's toxic. So in our community, I try to keep the energy level high. And sometimes it comes across with male bravado that may not be all that palatable for certain audience members. 
I'm not changing. You filter it. If you can't, go find someone else. I'm not going to be something I can't be, especially if I'm live. If I'm, if I'm live, that's a, it's unfiltered, and I'm going to have these swings. And it may be entertaining to you. It may be offensive to you. I might talk in a language that sometimes isn't appropriate for children. You shouldn't listen to me in a live setting with children around you. Sending me an email, you complaining to me that your kids heard me say the F word. First of all, I'm leaving that responsibility to you as a parent. You don't know what's going to be said in a live setting. So why invite the opportunity for your little ones to hear something inappropriate? I don't have the ability sometimes to keep control of my tongue. It's just the way it is. I don't want to talk this way, but sometimes it just starts. And once it starts, it takes its course. It runs its course. And then that imbalance settles down and kind of like what I'm talking like now. If I talk another hour from now and don't get off here, you'll hear me rev up again. It's not planned. It's not scripted. It's just, unfortunately, that's what happens. And when I lose control of it, go off the rails, my mind reaches for language that isn't always appropriate. And I don't feel good about it when I'm done. I ask for forgiveness and I feel like I could have done better. And, but I can't be articulate all the time, live. That's why I've always stayed in pre-recorded lectures. And I edit out a lot of that stuff. Because it's always in there. <laughs> it's always in there. So... I'm a real person. I mean, I'm not AI. I'm not some fake fucking shit. It's I'm a real person with emotions, a mental disorder that I wrestle with. It's not always been easy to deal with, but I know my shit and I prove it. And my students are bringing the receipts and I'm so proud of them. And I'm proud of you. That's in the making right now that you may have gone through drawdown. You may have done a little bit of damage to yourself because Friday was seeking destroying the morning session. Up, down, up, down, up, down. If you fell victim to that, it's okay. You'll fall victim to it again in the future too. Sometimes seek and destroy starts off just like a day that's obvious it's going to do this. And then it smokes your ass. Then you think it's doing something other than that. And it smokes your ass again. And then you have to know right then and there. Okay, stop. I just took two trades that were losing trades in the same session. Stop. ICT, you just gave us a silver bullet. There's a fair value gap between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock every single day. Well, guess what happens if you lose? Stop. Don't trade the morning session. Wait to the PM session. And your goal is to at least get 50% of the drawdown you had in the morning. You could get all of it and more, but your goal is to just get 50% of it. Isn't that a little bit more forgiving than I got to get that back and make a profit for the day? I have to be right. There's a difference there. There's a difference, and you have to treat yourself like that as a trader. It's not always trophy wins. Sometimes it's just I'll get a little bit of the hair of the dog that bit me. And you have to be content with that. And let time do its thing by presenting you new opportunities that will repeat every week, every day, and it won't stop. Unless you do what Retail Rick is telling you to do, impulsiveness, things that you know, you know, right before you get into those days that go into drawdown or blow your account, you can go back in time and think there was a moment when you said, I better not do this. Fuck it. I'm going in. That was it. That's the test, and you failed it. Every single time that's ever happened for me, I never looked back and said, I didn't see that coming. You knew. I knew. It's the way it is. You just got to do it. You just got to do it. Fuck around and find out. In this business, you fuck around and you can find out that you're out of this business. You can cause more damage to yourself financially than you're equipped to pay for. You don't think so? Over leverage in front of CPI. 
Yeah, you'll be owing the broker. <laughs> It'll take everything he's got in your account, plus some, and they'll be calling you up real quick with that. So you have to be very careful how you place these expectations on yourself when you're trying to recuperate drawdown, when you're trying to build equity to new equity highs, when you feel that you know that this is probably not the right thing to do, wait. Wait. Just take a step away, 10 minutes. Go get a drink, go outside, walk the dog, whatever, come back. If the trade moves without you, who cares? If it hasn't moved and it moved the other direction, you'll be thankful. If it moves but it hasn't gone to the target you're aiming for, fair value gap, institutional order flow, entry drill. There's your, there's your mechanism to get in. That's not chasing price. So why are you pressuring yourself? Why are you making this harder than it has to be? Because it's all in between your ears. That's what you're doing. The battlefield that you're waging war on is inside your head. Those candlesticks don't know you're in the trade. They don't know. The algorithm does not know that you got in that trade. It does not know. It doesn't. It's going where it's going because it's scripted. And it's designed to take whoever is foolish enough to be on the wrong side. That's the mechanics of how these markets work. That's the fucking reality of it. And I don't give a fuck who you are. Buying and selling pressure my fucking ass. Okay, that's not how this works, man. So remove all that necessity of being right, always right, and fix drawdown right away. Fixing drawdown right away is not the proper way of doing it. And truth be told, every time I've done a, a call online and I did it wrong, I wish I would have stopped that day right then and say, I'm going to stop here. But because of my obsessive compulsiveness and the fact that I absolutely love rubbing my haters' nose and shit, I know how to go in the opposite direction. Like I can flip on a dime. I can do that. And then that's what I do. I'm like, boop, boop. now you think that that's revenge trade. No, that's me aligning myself up with what I know is about to happen. And that doesn't sound good. I know there's a lot of people that's probably profitable traders, maybe trading for a long time. And they hear me say that stuff. Like, I know. I know. And you'll hear people that make a career out of you got to be careful listening to people that say they know what the market's going to do. Get the fuck out of here with that bullshit. Get out of here because I'm going to tell you something right now. Anybody that pushes a fucking button that doesn't believe that the market's going to go in their fucking favor, what the fuck are you doing? What is it that you're doing by placing risk on a trade? You're buying because you think it's going to go up to your fucking target that you have a limit order on. You have a stop that says, I don't think it's going to go lower than this and be good still. You bought. You're in the trade. The same fucking person is going to tell you, you got to be careful when you hear people say they know what the market's going to do. Listen, man, I know what high probability is. I know how to define it. My students know how to define it. I know when it's lacking and it's not in the marketplace. I'm only trying to press the button in those conditions, and I try to teach you how to avoid when it's not there. They don't know shit. They're taking their fucking indicator-based bullshit, but they're still subscribing to the belief that they believe the market's going to go up there. If they didn't believe that, they wouldn't be buying it. So think about the logic of these fucking asshats, these chuckle-fuck motherfuckers that are out there simply saying stupid nonsense. React to price. You'll never know what price is doing. This is Goldman Sachs fucking level horseshit. Intraday charts are noise. If anybody tells you they can make money trading with intraday charts, run away from them. I promise you. I guarantee you. We're doing it every day. That's Goldman Sachs. That's the boys from Goldman Sachs. Aren't they supposed to be the fucking guys that know everything? <laughs> I don't know. Do they? Sounds like a bunch of bullshit to me. But anyway... There's got to be losers to this, right? There has to be. But even those guys in Goldman Sachs, 
I wish they would learn how this is really done. Because they're indoctrinated to with the shit that Goldman pushes on them. This is their models. This is what they do. This is all they do. And they're extremely profitable. I mean, you can look at the reports that they put out and they tell you how many trades they won, how many, tra- how many trades they lost and how much they money they lost and how much they made. That's amazing information. But they don't know what you're learning. They don't. Believe me, they don't. They're not the smart money. They're just consistent about what they do. Now, if you call that smart money, no, that's your definition of it. But smart money is what I'm teaching you. The way they, that we perceive price, how it's delivered algorithmically based on time and price, these signatures that repeat over and over again, that's not randomness. We're not surprised when shit happens. Think about this, okay? I'm going to say this and I'm going to close because I haven't eaten today. I'm feeling my body tell me I'm low on energy. Wouldn't, wouldn't think that based on the delivery of all this uh, banter this morning, right? <laughs> That's the only benefit of having chemical imbalances. It's like fucking nitrous oxide. You know, when I'm running low and all of a sudden, <clears throat> I'm out the gate running. But when it, bear, when it wears off, it's like a crash. So I just lost my train of thought. This rarely happens for me. New week opening gaps. Thank you, Jesus. Think about how, when I introduced that concept, oh, yeah, everybody knows about a gap ICT. Fuck off, pal. What I'm talking about is how it constantly refers back to them over and over again, not simply when it fills them in and they're done in, they're done in everybody else's eyes. I'm looking at shit months ago, months ago. These new week opening gaps are not done simply because they're traded to and filled in. That's not, that's, not how, that's not how this works, man. But believe me, the folks that put this shit in motion, they don't mind that you know there's a gap because they can't hide that. And they're thankful and happy that you understand that, yeah, it goes up there and fills it in, and then it's done. And they know that you're, go, you're no longer worrying about it. These gaps have always existed in price action, yes. But the logic that I employ with it and teach you has not always been there. It's always been happening in the charts. But because you're not annotating your charts and having them on your charts, and nobody's ever taught this shit before, you never noticed it. How long... Do new week opening gaps hold importance to me? 60 days. The the data ranges that I talk about in my core content, that a lot of my students, when I taught that, that sometimes they quit at that month. They were like, oh, he's bullshit. He's putting filler. This is bullshit. It has nothing to do with anything. This is fucking dumb. Uh, Hey, Joker. Hey, clown. Okay. This is the shit that works with it. Stupid fucking people that think they know everything. They come to a teacher, an educator, and they come and they think, well, this is, this is how I'm supposed to be taught. This is how I'm, I'm supposed to learn this. You have no idea what the fuck you're learning. You have no idea what you're doing. And you literally stopped learning right when it was getting good. Stupid people. Stupid fucking people. But whatever. Think about how these new week opening gaps perform. I'm not teaching anymore with them because I have things I'm going to add in my book. Yes. Yes, I'm going to sell a book. And I don't give a fuck who has an attitude about it. I don't care because there's so many people right now that are writing books every time I talk with these Twitter spaces, every time I do a lecture, every time I do a live stream. They're right now writing books because they're trying to beat me to the punch because they can say my book was out first but motherfuckers my shit was in fucking social media on YouTube before you were even fucking doing your book and yes that shit matters to me because it's my life's work you jackasses are running around trying to get clout and I will be in your reviews reminding people that you just talked shit on an echo of me 
And when they're seeing that comment that you can't do anything about, right? John Fibonacci, John Flood, couldn't wait to take my fucking mentorship and take it out there and make some horse shit fucking book. I'm in that fucking review, ain't I? And everybody sees it. And they come to that channel on YouTube and they say that, that you're a clown. You're a fucking fraud. And even Amazon had to put a disclaimer saying, this shit has got something wrong with it. Welcome. Welcome to the reality. And there's a bunch more of you fucking yahoos on, you, uh, on Amazon that I'll be putting reviews in too. And you all can come sock puppet all the bullshit you want when I put mine out. I don't give a fuck. I'm going to laugh at all of them. All of them. Because it's all on record with me calling it live here. You're all watching. You're in a GAN moment right now. Think about that. You're in a Wyckoff age right now. Not because I'm using Wyckoff, but I'm upsetting everything in this industry. I knew this in 1995. 1995, I knew I would be talking to people just like you and upsetting everything. But I was being pressured not to do that for a long time. And it took years for me to build the confidence to go just a little bit outside the lines, the boundaries that I'm not allowed to go past. And I said, fuck it, I'm going to create a language. If I create a language and I teach people using that language, the people that would be upset with me can't be fucking upset with me because the things that I'm doing, I'm attributing it to the language that I created that just comes real, real fucking close to the things I can't teach you. So at this point, the cat's out of the bag. They can't call it back in. They can't change it. They can't stop it. And if I stop right now, you already know how to do it. But I did not break my word or what was placed on me as a limitation. But I didn't do well with that. It bothered me because the sign says don't step on the grass. And I'm going to fucking moonwalk on that shit. It's just my nature. It's human nature. Don't do this. Tell that to your little kid that just started walking. Tell your toddler. Don't touch that. They're going to look right at your face and, fucking face and smile and do exactly what you said not to do because they want to see how you're going to react. You love me. You're my, you're my play toy. You give me food. You change my ass. You put me to bed. You bathe me. You entertain me. You said don't do this. Let me touch it and see what you do with that. Bit. I'm just like that. I'm like a kid at heart. You tell me I'm not supposed to do that. I'm going to fucking do it. I'm impulsive. I can't control myself sometimes. And yes, I was scared for a long time. And truth be told, if I get another visit, <laughs> I'll probably stop before November. But I have created a language and they, under they understand it. They understand what I did. But you have learned a language that didn't exist before. It's not in retail logic. This shit is totally outside of all that stuff. And you're here right now listening to what they're going to write about in fucking books when I'm gone. You're here. You're seeing it happen live, real time, proving that this shit is absolutely rigged. And somebody knows how it's rigged. And they can teach you how to take advantage of that. And that's exciting. It's fun. Nobody's getting hurt by it. But these greedy motherfuckers want it just for themselves. And they use it like a fucking weapon. And you never knew about it. You never knew about it. But that's the reality of it. That's what really goes on. And they perpetuate things with financial news network channels and websites and talking heads and all this bullshit that constantly feeds you misinformation. 
and you never notice it. But it's always there, hidden in plain sight. They'll never change it, folks. They will never change it. I'm proving it. And there's people still pissing and moaning saying there is no algorithm. I work at a brokerage firm. I work at a trading desk. I'm a this and I'm a that. There is not. Get the fuck out. Of it. I don't give a fuck. You have blinders on. Nobody's this precise. <laughs> Nobody. Nobody using other bullshit retail garbage can see this stuff like this. They can pull it out after the fact, which is, in my opinion, Wyckoff is great for explaining yesterday's news. It's great. You can learn price action with Wyckoff. Yes, you can. But you cannot get this level of precision with it. You can't. And the people that fanboy it because they don't want to give me the credit for the shit they're really trading with, you know, I don't care, dude. I don't care. You can call it supply and demand if it helps you sleep at night, but order blocks are not supply and demand. But you'll see that there is something totally different in this neck of the woods. It's a certain measure of confidence. I loved, I absolutely loved that funded account uh, interview. And for the life of me, I apologize, I can't remember. I don't want to say the name inappropriately and give another company credit when it wouldn't be them. So um, it's the farmer uh, guy that helps fund his, uh, his operation with, uh, with his trading. The comment that the host said, he said, most of our funded payouts are ICT traders. And when he stated something that I have been trying to communicate for all this time, when you learn from me and you finally find your model, you will be part of the category of trader that he mentioned. When we interview students that, or not students, traders that get payouts, nobody else but ICT traders are as confident as they are. Like they know what they're doing. And we know when we're talking to someone else that, that got a payout, we can tell that they just got lucky. That's not my words. That's, that's the company representative saying that. I know that stings like a motherfucker, Vinny. But guess what? That's the reality of it all. That's just the way it is around here. And all you got to do is join the club. <laughs> so, the invitation's still open, bro. I ain't got no hate for you. You talked all that shit about my family, made up all this bullshit lies. Wall Street, bring that fucking shit. I don't give a fuck. Bottom line is, is I'm still going to be winning. Period. What I've already released, people are going to use it. They're going to make lots of money. Some people will fail. Some people will lose money. It doesn't change the fact that shit works. It just means they did themselves in. That's human nature. That's just the way it is. Sometimes people just fuck up. And you just got to make some changes. Recalibrate yourself. And get back on the horse and ride it. Or get back in the car and drive it until the brakes fall off. But you can't do that when you lose control and focus because if you can't stop yourself when you're out of control, when you're doing all this dumb shit recklessly, trying to get back to an equity high or fix a boo-boo, losing trade, you will do more damage psychologically that's going to be more impactful than losing the money in the account. Because you'll create scar tissue. In your learning, in your perception about what it is that you're doing and about yourself, you'll create scar tissue. And scar tissue doesn't have elasticity. So you can't grow easily. It's painful to grow. And that's what happens when you do the wrong thing with toxic mindset. And you try to progress. You're, you're limited. And that's why people many times quit because they can't get to, they can't get past it. You have to tear through that scar tissue, which creates more scar tissue. And it's painful. And I teach you and lecture you so that way you don't go through that stuff needlessly. It's always self-inflicted. Am I teaching you how to go through this without taking a loss? No. I'm teaching you how to avoid blowing your account. 
I'm teaching you how to endure drawdown and mitigate it, yes. But losing trades are going to come. The human aspect to this is not something you can avoid. You're going to do it wrong. That's where the losing trades come in. Not because the concepts are flawed. You saw it incorrectly. I authored this stuff, and sometimes I do it wrong. I get a case of the ass. I'm hopped up on goofballs. I want to prove something. You know, there it is. It's done. I've invited, I've invited some external stimuli into the decision making mechanisms that caused me to push that trade on. And then when the adverse reaction comes, I'm not surprised by it because I invited something outside. I've invited chaos in, and chaos does what? Shows up on time. So you don't want to be doing all of these things when you're in drawdown that promote speed, aggression, get back quickly, because all of that is the opposite of what you should be doing. And I've never really read a book that's, in my opinion, met how to deal with drawdown appropriately. Not, not to the degree like, like I'm talking about here. I can talk about this topic a lot because as a young man, I, I did my ass in a lot with dumb shit. Like, I'm not making this stuff up as I'm going along. I went through it. I know what it's like to feel like you're doing the right things. And know now, looking back, every aspect of those things I was doing, feeling like I was doing the right thing, hoping to fix the situation, the drawdown, or you know, getting right back in real quick just because I had the money, the refund another account, that was the worst thing to do. How can you apply that today? If you had a funded account challenge and you passed it and you're funded, right? Or you open up an account and you're trading with real money. You made that decision on your own. I never tell you to do that. When do you know? When do you know when to make that transition? When you're bored with being consistent in your demo and you don't have any emotion at all. You don't care when you're right. You don't care when you got it wrong. That's the right mindset. That's the time when people should consider it, but not before if you're antsy, excited about the wind being right all the time, you're not ready because you're bringing emotion into the, the monetary transaction of real fund trading. And you're going to be constantly concerned about the outcome on a scorecard or report card basis, profitable or, or not profitable. And if you're thinking like that, you're not thinking about following the model and the rule of being in that trade for the reasons you're supposed to be in that trade. You're looking at the profit and loss ticking up and down, watching the trade. Let me ask you this. When you put a trade on, how often does your eye go to what the profit and loss amount is? For some of you, if you're thinking to yourself, you know, I'm always watching that shit, you're not ready to be trading with real money because your focus is on that, not watching price. Is price constantly giving you feedback in its delivery? Are you on side? Are you off side? If you're watching the up and down movements of the ticker that tells you what you're making or losing while you're in the trade, you're distracted. I only have that up there so you can see it, that it was a button being pushed. When I trade, I don't have that up there. I, I don't give a fuck about that. I'm watching price. Is price going to my targets? Is price respecting the most recent three PD arrays that I want to see being supportive of price, whether the price is going higher or lower? I'm watching that shit. That's what matters to me. Because if I'm not paying attention to that, I'm not going to notice when it's telling me it's no longer a good trade. So either kill it or take something off. Remove risk. Compare and contrast that, knowing what you know about yourself and your attention span. If you're watching profit tick up and down, up and down, like you know the game. When I was younger, I wanted to see, okay, all right, $200 more, it'll be $1,000, okay? And you start talking to it. All right, come on, come on, $1,000, come on. Come on, baby, $1,000, woo, 
thousand hours. I promise, if it goes a thousand hours, I'm going to get out. If it just gives me a thousand hours, please, please, just give me a thousand hours. Now it's drawn down. It's down. It's only up five hundred hours. You were up seven fifty, but you were wanting a thousand. Please, please, just, all right, just get back to seven fifty. Fuck it. I, I don't need a thousand. Just give me seven fifty. I promise. If it just get, if you just give me that, I'll get out. I swear to God Almighty. I, just give me that. I'll get out. Now it's, you're only up two fifty. What the fuck's going on? Where's my thousand dollars? Why can't I get seven fifty? Fuck it. If it goes to five hundred hours, I'm getting out. I, I, fuck this. It's a drawdown. Fuck this. Nobody knows how to make money. This is bullshit. This fucking broker did it to me again. There you go. That's it. That's retail 101. That happens because you're watching that ticker that shows you the profit and loss. The whole time, the chart's telling you, you're on the wrong side now. Hello? This open, high, low, and close bar here is telling you you're on the wrong side. It's in your face like a neon sign, but you're not seeing it because you're watching the money. Everybody falls victim to that. Everybody does. There's never been a trader that's come into this industry that never had that happen to them. They have had that happen. And sometimes the break-even traders that can't be profitable, the number one rule that helps them get past that just always break-even is stop worrying about the money. Do not have that shit on your chart. Because if you're focusing on the money, you can't look at price. You set all these little milestones, little little goals for yourself. You have a trade. You have a limit order that it's supposed to trade to. And all of a sudden, you start worrying about a specific dollar amount because you can't stand to be in the trade. You're not submitting to the limit order being reached or the target being reached. You start looking at the profit and thinking to yourself, you know, I had a win in a while. I, I, I gotta go on social media and show somebody something. Shit, I gotta get that thousand dollars. Thousand dollars, that's you know, it's a band. I gotta share that publicly. I don't need to get that three thousand. I'm really supposed to be holding for, and I can't really hold it because I'm impatient as fuck. So let me get that one thousand dollars. And you enter that same situation I had as a young man with copper. You want that target? There's no reason for that actually happening now because the chart has changed direction. Price is going to go the other way. But damn it, this is your target. You're supposed to trade your plan and play in your trade, right? Okay, you're in the trade. You have a higher target. You're looking or it's waiting if it goes up there to get you out. But notice what's happening here. You've allowed the concerns about money to hide what price is telling you. And now you're submitting to the fact that you don't have patience. That's a good thing. If you know that you can't hold on to the trade, kill it. Because if you stay in it, you may experience a turnaround. If you know that you are not capable of sticking to that trade idea and it's now making you physically uncomfortable where you can't cope, it's not weakness to get out of that. You condition yourself to get out of it, and if it goes there, then you encourage yourself by saying, "Okay, see, if I would stay with it, it would have did that." But you didn't make the um, you didn't make the money, ICT. So that's fucking stupid, dude. You're acting like you go out there on your first run and getting all these targets, no partials. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, but that shit's that's dumb. You have to grow. You have to progress incrementally, and nobody walks out there doing full pulls. I don't give a fuck who you are, who'd you learn from. I'm the best, and my students don't go out there like that. I teach them partials. they got to get their little cookies as along the way, and it grows over time their confidence. But when you feel that temptation to just bail on the trade, even when you're in profit because you can't stand it, you just can't stand it. You don't know what's going to happen. You've lost the plot. You're no longer submitting to the trade idea. So you're in there doing what? Gambling, hoping and praying. Now you're a religious trader. Please let it get there. Who are you talking to? When you're talking to your monitor, who the fuck are you talking to? I don't know who I was talking to, but we're doing it, right? Please, please just let it get to 1,000. If it gets to 1,000, that'll be enough for me. You know damn well if it goes to 1,000, you're going to think, shit, it might go 1,200. But if I get out of 1,200, what if it went to 1,500? And then you're, not, you're, you're playing a game. Like you're fucking around. And you, some of you might be laughing your ass off right now because you've been there before. But it really shouldn't be funny. You should identify that moment 
where you have lost the plot of the trade. And as soon as you start thinking, I needed to do this. I need it to do this. You don't need shit but to get out of the trade. That's what you need to do. Because now you're on a hope and prayer. And hope and prayer in that setting right there, your prayers are being answered. The price is telling you it's about to go the other direction. And you're not seeing it because you're looking at that profit ticker, the up and down fluctuation of your profitability. Hoping that it gets to some random fucking number that has absolutely no reason for price that really, really reached there. But that's because that's what you want. That's your trophy. That's your cookie. You're reaching into the jar. You're constantly digging down in there feeling for that last cookie. You want that last one. But it's not there. Carl's been there the fucking day before and got that last motherfucker. Sorry. Day late and a cookie short. Your $1,000 profit ain't getting delivered to you. And then what happens? It moves down a little bit. And you lower it. Okay. Okay. I ain't going to get a full cookie. But there might be a half of that cookie left. You know what it's like when you get in the cookie jar. Some of them break. I, 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 there ain't none left, really. But there, let me just feel if there's any crumbs down there that I can put together and get some kind of a shit out of it. So you start making deals with yourself. Okay, if it goes to seven fifty, I'll get out. I promise. Who are you promising? Who are you talking to? You're talking out your ass. Because you're not going to do that if it does it. So why are you doing it? You're pantomiming. You're talking out your ass. You're trying to pretend you have, well, the capability to follow through with a rule when you've already shown that you don't have that already. And you are doing what? You're speaking to a fucking computer screen that cannot hear you. It's not going to reason with you. Price is not going to say, well, you know what? I have been an asshole to you recently, and I've caused a lot of trades not to pay in your favor. So listen, pal, you know, it's no hard feelings. It's nothing personal. I'm going to give you something today. I'll throw you a bone. Here's $1,000. Let's get out your target. It ain't fucking happening like that. So why are you even going through the motions of doing this shit, talking to the screen? Come on, come on, please, please. Do this, do this. Get the fuck out of here. You have lost the plot. Now, I have done many times, teasingly, Either in my recording, sometimes I'll, I'll type out, it's, it's teasing me, it won't go down there. And all of a sudden, it, just, it goes right to my target and then fills me. That's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying, I, am, I know where it's going. I'm, it's clearly being illustrated in the chart. I'm not on there saying, please, please, please let this do not, I know where it's reaching for. But you as a new student, new trader, you're going to be in a, sit a setting where you're in a trade. And it's going to be impossible for you to hold on to it. And I don't know really what goes on that creates that condition. I think it's a matter of lack of experience, not knowing what you're looking for. And usually that creeps into your trading after you had a series of losing trades. So finally, when you get into something and you're impatient because you want that trade to run real, real quick to your target, and it might not be doing that. And it might be showing you it's actually reversing, but you don't have that perception or skill set because, number one, you're probably in drawdown and everything you're looking at through price is distorted. So you're really not seeing things clearly. So the only thing that's clear to you is you want $1,000 out of that trade. And it's getting real close to flashing on it and your screen saying $1,000. But what you're saying is, is you're trying to fucking play – a video game where you're going to try to time exiting when it gets to a thousand dollars because it might flash there a thousand one time and you didn't get off there. It could go there, flash one time and never be there. And then you're frustrated. So really what you're doing is you're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself. You're pantomiming like you know what you're doing. And you're trying to convince yourself with every ounce of your being because you're talking to yourself. You're literally out of your fucking mind. You're talking to yourself in a computer screen that has no ability to understand or even reason with you. Think about that. 
It's fucking madness, right? But that's what you're doing. You're doing that. You're fucking talking to an inanimate, an inanimate object, your screen. And you're hoping and praying that it will listen to you. You're praying that that open, high, low, and closed bar is going to favor you and give you what, you what you want. If you are talking to the marketplace like that, and you're literally praying that it does that, you're, you've lost the plot. You have literally lost control of yourself. And the best thing to do is collapse the trade. That's the best thing. And yes, sometimes it'll run and go to your target. But guess what? You were already indicating that you were not willing to stay patient long enough for that to happen. So what are you learning by staying in that environment where you can't submit to it? And now you're begging and praying to the God of your screen to answer your prayer and give you a thousand dollar win or whatever that target would be. Think about it. Staying in that environment is not teaching you anything. It's furthering this pursuit of things that are external instead of internal. You're seeing your body, your mind, give you indications that you are now in a position that's uncomfortable. Is there something wrong with you getting out when it was at 750? Because you don't think that it's going to go ultimately to your target and you don't have the patience to hold on to it. What's wrong, about, what's wrong with that idea of just collapsing the trade? Nothing. It's the same thing with a the partial. They fucking pay every time, 100% of the time. They never fail. So when somebody comes behind this message that I'm giving you today, with no proof they fucking trade profitably, they can't call shit, they ain't done shit, but they're going to say, this is stupid, ICT said this, dumb shit, blah, 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 blah. Counter it with you doing it live. How's that work for you? Okay. There's your challenge. Everybody's got talking shit about there, you know, talking about me and my concepts. Go out there and start doing it better. I'll watch your live stream. And if you're good, I'll say so. And I'll bring people to your fucking shit. But if you're talking out your ass and you ain't got nothing, bringing nothing to it, your, your, your opinion is moot. It, it's nothing. It's shit. Garbage. So it's, when I'm telling you that you are wrestling now, and you don't know what you're going to submit to anymore. And now you just pull it out of your ass. Well, I hope it flashes up this much money in my profit. If it does, I'll get out. That right there indicates to you, if you're thinking it and if you start talking it, you have lost control. That is the last sign that you are now mad. That's the confirmation that you're out of your fucking mind because you're literally talking out loud praying for something that you have no control over and it's less than what you started to trade with. It's less than the target that started this whole idea of you bidding in the marketplace. So if you're now in this position where you're begging for the market to give that to you and it starts moving away and you feel the impulse to lower it, okay, now just give me this. Fuck that. Get out. Just get out of that and treat it like it's a partial and the balance just got stopped out at break even. That's how you that's how you wrestle with that. And you cancel it. You don't have any room for negative thinking about it. You don't beat yourself up about it. It is what it is. What did you do wrong? You fucking made money. You made money. You didn't get your thousand dollars. You made seven fifty. Fuck it. Seven fifty is better than not having seven fifty. It's better than losing seven fifty. Everything's about perception and how you think about it. And the books and the bullshit you listen to these people out there, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And that stupid logic they give you, you shouldn't take partials. You shouldn't pay yourself is what the fuck they're saying. Run the risk with your low probability bullshit of not getting your targets filled. It's all or nothing. Partials are stupid. That's someone telling you don't make money and making money is dumb. That's the equivalent to that. You want to listen to that shit? Man, get the hell out of here. I ain't got time for that. That's some Mickey Mouse fucking logic right there. Don't take profits. Taking profits is stupid. The profits that are 
payable all the time. They never fail to make its way into your bottom line on your statements. Okay. Next. Turn the channel if someone's talking like that. You're here learning how to read price. Why? Because you want to make fucking money. When the market offers that opportunity for you to take money out of it, you take it. Especially when you're inexperienced. Because you might just be in a run that's short-lived and what you think is a target may not really pan out. And you can't just take, in the beginning, every trade and run with it until the brakes fall off it. You have to look at things objectively. Be reasonable with yourself. Acknowledge the fact that you're inexperienced. And hey, you know what? I may be fucking completely wrong about where this market's going to go. But guess what? It's offered me 10 handles. It's offered me five handles. I might be looking for 30. But let me take something at five. Let me take something at 10. But you'll never be able to get that high multiple R payout ICT by doing that. In the beginning, you won't fucking be able to have that wherewithal to hold for it. So you grow in your knowledge and your experience getting to that level of trade. I have trades that I put on all the time, and I have a best case limit order. My students know this about me. I'm not always suggesting that this is exactly where the market's going to go. When there's an opportunity for it to go beyond what I think is reasonable, I put my limit order there because sometimes you get these wild, crazy runs, and it's just nice to be able to catch that tiger by the tail. If you don't have your limit order there and it goes there, you can't make money with that. So I know that sometimes in my trades, I will be just outside of the range that's reasonable. But I'm taking partials along the way to prove to you that it's going in the right direction and I don't need to see my full terminus target reached. And what am I teaching you? How to get paid and you don't need to be right. That is the best way to learn. I wish I was trained that way as a young 20-year-old. I wish I would have been taught that. It would have saved me so many blown accounts because there's lots of times I had trades that were in my favor and I held for the fucking target. Took nothing off and they reverse and come back and stop me out in a loss. Don't ever let a winning trade ever turn on to you and make a, a, a net loss. If the market's moving and it gives you five handles, take something off. But what happens if I'm only trading one contract? Take your fucking trade off. Grow in your knowledge and your experience until you get to able to find the five handle, I'm mean, sorry, the 10 handle runs. And you can not feel the impulse to take off at five. And you submit yourself to what? Lock in two handles and reach for the 10. If it comes back and stops you out at two, okay, no problem. You took a partial at two and stopped out on break even. That's how you look at it. It's all about perception. But when you go in and you listen to these Mickey Mouse mentors sitting around with their fucking computer screens, their fucking backs showing in their displays, and they don't know anything, you never see them trading. They got a lot of shit to say about everybody else in their private circles, but they ain't got the balls to do it publicly. Don't take partials. This guy's a fraud. This guy's a bunch of bullshit, blah, blah, blah. When you listen to that dumb logic, you're going to have stunted growth. You won't have results that you can grow and feel confident with, which is necessary in this industry. It's not an overnight success for anybody. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. And it won't be for you. You're going to learn a lot about yourself, the things that you're going to bring to this as a problem, but you won't think it's a problem. And what's funny is men that come into this industry that think they have certain skill sets or, or strengths in their personal characters, that's usually the thing that fucks them up. Oh, I'm confident, and you're overconfident, and that's how you blow your account. The only skill set that I think is interesting that still causes problems is the people that say they're very patient, they end up becoming too patient and they wait too long. The move starts happening.
because they're patiently waiting for something perfect. And perfect, in the beginning when you're learning, you can't identify that. You don't know what it is. Over time, spending time with me and teaching what price delivery is like, where it should go, why it should do it, then obviously you can recognize what precision, and precise perfection in price delivery is. And you try to operate with that over time. But in the beginning, you don't try to force precision at all in the beginning. It's forgiving. You give yourself, wait for the run, wait for the retrace, wait for the fair value gap, then get in. You didn't get at the high. I mean, I'm sorry, you didn't get in at the highest high at the turtle soup, false breakout. You're waiting for that displacement, then retracement up into a premium, and you're going, looking to go short. And you aim for consequent encroachment and the low of the fair value gap. That's your sweet spot. That's that optimal entry within a fair value gap. Because we always have to make an allowance for that fair value gap not to be entirely filled in. And when it doesn't fill in, that is very powerful insight. Because if it's expected to go lower and it doesn't fill in that fair value gap and it starts to break and run away, oh, man, that's when you want to make your partials a little bit further lower because it's probably going to do a lot more than you thought it was going to be. Chances are your first profit is probably not the right one. <laughs> it's going to probably go a lot more. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Your, your final profit, your first profit or partial should always be reasonable in you know, five or 10 handles if it's S you know, ES. If it's 4X, you know, 10 pips, 15 pips, 20 pips, something in that range, you should be looking for your first partial. But the idea of demanding precision or holding for your full target in the beginning, anybody that tells you that's what you should be trying to do right from Jump Street beginning, that's someone that's guaranteed not consistently profitable. They're not consistent. They're not confident in themselves. Um, and they're just making allowances for their inability to do themselves. But they want to coach people from the sidelines and seem smart. Because the, the idea is if they're, if they're talking like that and they're not promoting anything publicly, showing that they can do it, showing that they can call it beforehand, explaining it beforehand, the misnomer is, is, well, this person has a lot of people following him and he says this is what we should do. What's going to be uh, commonly viewed, that that's how he trades and therefore he's successful when you don't see anything like that. No proof to suggest that's even the case at all. When I'm telling you that I am precise, I'm proving that I'm precise and my students are doing it too, I'm telling you to take partials. Why? Because I want you to trust your progressive learning, how you're moving up in your understanding. In the beginning, you're going to have doubts. And that's normal. You're going to have a lack of confidence. And that's normal. And you overcome those things with these little baby steps of paying yourself at logical places like I'm teaching. It feels a whole lot better learning and not getting your target filled, but still getting something out of the move. And you were rewarded you put time and energy and attention into that idea and you watched it pan out. And if it fails and goes all the way against you, you're going to feel like this is bullshit. Nobody makes money and I'm not going to be successful. With it. So why, so why, why bother? Why study with this bullshit? There's too much ICT videos to go through. Fuck this. I'm not doing it. So I teach you to reward yourself. Pay yourself that cookie. You're in the jar digging for one. So take one. And when you do that, if it comes back and stops you out at break even, does it really hurt? No. That's why I teach it that way. You remember what? You had a positive payment coming out in your demo. That rewards your time and study. Because in your mind, you're thinking, if this was real money and that's, if this is all that happened, I still made money. I don't need to be right. Bingo. Bingo. That's the proper mindset. And the people that teach outside that way of delivery and progressive learning are fucking clueless. That's why you don't see anybody learning how to be profitable with them. You don't see them stepping forward and saying, here you go, I'm making money, look at this. Because they're using logic that's fucking short on logic that makes money. And I just don't have a tolerance for that shit. 
If something's right and it makes money, who am I to say it otherwise? But I'm sorry. I, I, I can't bite my tongue when I hear these fucking asshats, these chuckle fuck motherfuckers that out there talking out their ass, saying dumb shit. React to price. Don't, your job's not to predict where price is going to go. Don't take partials. Take your full target because the risk you put on doesn't justify the partials. Get the fuck out of here. You're talking to somebody or listening to somebody that probably has less than a 50% strike rate. Get the fuck out of here. You're not even in the same conversation with us. We're not doing 50% around here. We're not flipping quarters. That's 50 fucking 50. We're not 50-50 here. Okay? We're not doing that. That's unacceptable. Period. You should be aiming and living in a 70% strike rate. That's your fucking goal. Are you going to hit that rate out of the box? Nope. Are you going to get that in your first year? Nope. A few years from now, you will be. You're going to know when the shit is not favorable for you to be trading and it's high probability and high resistance is not lining up. It's going to be conflicting. So you'll stay out of the marketplace. You want low resistance and high probability. You'll identify when the market's like that. And then you will be in that moment trading with your maximum risk there. Not, I need something to happen because I'm in drawdown. I'm going to trade with maximum leverage in high resistance liquidity and low probability conditions because I'm in drawdown. I got to fix it. And maybe if I pray hard enough, the screen will give me what I'm asking for. And then you blow your account. Many of you that are brand new probably never thought about it like this because you haven't been doing it long enough. And it doesn't resonate with you. It just sounds like, you know, a pointless rant. Emotional, you know, talking points that don't have any relevance to you. But I promise you, the people that have been trading, they understand exactly what the fuck I'm talking about. They've been there. And they just, I guarantee you they can appreciate this level of discussion because now it makes perfect sense how they messed up, how to avoid it going forward, and they wish they would have known it beforehand. The same thing that you're hearing right now and not appreciating because you haven't traded with real money yet. You haven't gone through these, these growth periods where it's growing pains. And you all go through growing pains. Growth and understanding is going to come to you in this industry through pain. And you want to avoid it. I replied to somebody this morning uh, when I tweeted that uh, my son went into drawdown on Friday and it's the best thing he can have. And, and the surest way to reinforce following rules is experiencing pain. And the gentleman, I'm assuming it was a gentleman, says, how, how do we avoid those painful experiences? You go through them. You walk forward without quitting. That's what you do. Because what you're saying is, as a trader, how do I avoid losing? I don't have an answer for that. No one is going to have an answer for that. There is no 100% strike rate ever. It's not. It's not going to happen. I can't produce that for you. I can't teach that to you. I don't promise that to you. But what I do promise is that you will learn how to read price action more clearly than anything else out there can teach you. And at some point, here's where the gray area is, okay? At some point, when you get really, really good and consistent with being able to read price action, and you get bored with being correct in your analysis and the market painting in your favor, and you have no emotional stimuli attributed to it, you don't care. You don't have any kind of reaction that's either happiness or regret. It's just you know what's going to happen. You know how you're going to react to it, and you expected that to happen anyway. At that moment, it's going to happen for all of you at a different time, much longer than you want it to. I promise you that. But when you reach that moment where it's like that for you, then, then at that moment, you can consider trading with live funds when you decide so. But any time prior to that, I promise you, you are not prepared. 
you're rushing to do something and you're falling in line with these people that talk about trading with real money to learn how to trade. And that's the stupidest fucking shit anybody could say in this industry at all. It's fucking dumb. It's dumb. The only thing you're doing is guaranteeing you that you're going to feel what my son feels now. Regret. Scar tissues formed. He's going to make him scared to take the next trade. Even when the trade's good, he's going to be in importing all of that toxicity because he lost. He lost when he didn't really lose anything. It's a simulated environment. But in his mind, because he's new, he thinks he lost about $4,000. So it's monumental to him. And in every trade he takes going forward now, he's going to have the fear and anxiety of, is it going to lead to that again? And that's what happens when you listen to these people tell you to learn how to trade, not in a demo, but with a live account. That is the dumbest fucking shit. Dumb. Don't listen to that. I don't give a fuck who makes fun of me because I'm teaching in a demo. I'm responsible. I am responsible as a mentor. I'm telling you that this shit will hurt you. You want to have training wheels on. You want to have your safety fucking belt on. Helmets, fucking football pads, shin guards, every fucking thing, a mouth fucking piece. Because this fucking market will kick your fucking ass. You get in there trying to Mickey Mouse with it. You don't know what you're doing. And you're going to risk money. That little bitty account. That little bitty account that you said you're going to learn how to trade in. Be offside in front of CPI number coming out. That little account. Is going to be a big fucking account with a negative sign right in front of it. Hello, you owe us some fucking money that you don't have. That's the logic. In the reality, listen to these jokers that talk about learn how to trade with real money. Demo trades are stupid. Demo this. These are people that are not making money, folks. I guarantee you they're not. That's a, that's a mentor or attention seeker that doesn't like the fact that I catch a lot of flack because I teach through a demo and they don't have the balls to handle all that. When I came out publicly, stepped out there just like that and said, here's me. I'm going to teach you in a demo. I completely disarmed all of them. What are you going to say about me? <laughs> what are you going to say? I already said it's a demo. Go fuck yourself. I can call this shit, trade it better than any of you motherfuckers. And you're out here still trying to sell your shit. Nobody's buying it. They found something better. It's, it's just the way it is. By the way, I saw Sean Lee's back on uh, YouTube. I missed you, man. And I watched your shit this morning. The last video you just put up here, I liked your disposition in that video. You've been a character of some kind, but I, I like I like how, you, uh, how, you're, how you're conducting yourself now. So just let you know. I'm glad to see you're healthy and all that. But... Uh, I think I've rambled on enough, ramblers. I think we'll bring this one to a close because I am hungry. And we were supposed to stop this about two other times before. And if I mention anything more, I'm probably going to turn this into, uh, well, we started at 10 o'clock. It's almost four hours, right? I can go 30 more minutes, <laughs> but I'm not. The, uh, the session on Monday uh, will not be live streamed. So I don't know if I'll be doing anything in Twitter, calling anything, because I'll be working with my son. I have a mission with him now. So Monday and Tuesday, I think I'll own them for myself and my, and my son. So don't expect too much from me on Monday and Tuesday. So we'll see what we get. Um, I'll take a look at the economic calendar tonight and see where I think I'm going to do my two live streams for this week with you all. But uh, be very careful this week. Don't be in a hurry. Um, hold no bias until we see how we open on Sunday and then I'll probably I'll probably mention something at that time on, on Twitter I'll share some, some charts and ideas of what I think might be favorable for the week so that way it uh, gives you an idea of what I would be looking for with my son on Monday so that way you at least have something done in my head type scenario okay and until I talk to you next time enjoy the rest of your weekend study don't do too much studying. Enjoy yourself. Have something outside of uh, the markets, okay? And I will tickle your Twitter later this week. Until then, be safe.